You're very welcome to this afternoon's Executive Office Committee meeting. Um, we'll begin with item one, which is the apologies. And I have received an apology from the Deputy Chair, Doug Beatty. Uh, any other apologies? Okay, thank you. Um, item two is Chairman's Business. Just to draw your attention in the pack that the Chairman's Liaison Group have uh, issued a memo. It is asking and seeking the views of individual members on how best to improve scrutiny. Uh, so if I could encourage members to complete that, uh, it feeds back in from all the committees and then the Chairman's Liaison Group uh, as a grouping can assess uh, what needs and what requirements there are as a result of that. So uh, could I encourage members to do that? And I'll make a note to do it myself as well, actually. It would be good. Um, item three is draft minutes of our meeting from the 10th of March. They're at page 10 of the meeting pack. Um, are members content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings of that meeting? Okay, not, not getting any sense, so we'll take that as grand and we'll get those signed then for the future. Uh, item four is matters arising from that meeting. And just to draw members' attention on page 19, where we have a response from the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse regarding the redress panels. Uh, at the last meeting, it was agreed that we would write to the Cossica asking for her views at the pace of work of the redress panels and the lack of direct engagement between survivors and uh, redress panels. Now, I've received, along with the Vice Chair, Deputy Chair, uh, correspondence from some of the sectoral groups, uh, again, highlighting some of the issues and concerns that there are. I was going to make a recommendation to the committee, which is they detail a number of points, but I think they have dovetailed with the response that's come back in from the commissioner. So what I was going to suggest was that if the clerk could sort of compare those two things in terms of what the sector were asking for and what the commissioner has said, and that maybe they're seeking a meeting with myself and the deputy chair, that we would proceed to that meeting and do it on the basis of what that comparison is. And then hopefully that will help us to zone in on just what the outstanding issues are, and then we can relay them back to the commissioner. Would that be acceptable to people? Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, members. Um, on page 26 of the meeting pack, um, there is the paper that was prepared on the back of all the presentations that we had from the High Street Task Force uh, stakeholder session on the 3rd of March. Um, given that there was quite a lot of information and it's all been pulled together there, my suggestion was um, is that we maybe ask Reyes to prepare a document for us. Just There was a number of references to things that happened in Scandinavia, in Toronto, and various parts of England, that maybe if the Reyes could do a bit of an investigation for us to give that comparisons. And then what we would do is during our next term, we could ask the officials to come up and we would have that preparatory paper. We would have it and could assess it, and that would lead us into maybe uh, an oral briefing session with them in the next term. Would that be agreeable to members? Okay, that seems to me. Thank you very much. Okay, um, that moves us on then to item five, uh, which is the Programme for Government Outcomes Framework, the Assembly Research and Information Service uh, paper, which is on page 30 to 62 of the uh, committee pack. If I could ask the communication team just to move Stephen Orm up into the uh, spotlight for us there. Um, if we have Stephen up, if he were there, you are Stephen. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, no Stephen, we'll pass over to yourself then. Maybe if you want to take us through that here, and then if members have any questions at the end, uh, they could ask you. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I'll do the usual and just make sure that people can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Um, so this briefing, um, I think the chair was kind of touching on it there, but um, this briefing will cover two papers that were were provided to the committee. Um, so. Firstly, a paper published in January of this year uh, and prepared proactively by the research service. And that paper kind of considers outcomes-based accountability or OBA as, as a system and its employment in the executive's program for government up until now. And then secondly, uh, a briefing note, which considers the draft outcomes framework itself um, and notes issues arising from that that the committee might want to consider. Um, I'm aware that the briefing today has been scheduled um, in advance of the session with TU officials who will be discussing that consultation on the on the outcomes framework. Um, so my focus today will be on assisting the committee in that light. 
Uh, I'll first provide a refresher on the OBA approach in general and um, detail some of the, the strengths and limitations of that approach in practice, and then try to draw briefly on the Scottish experience of, of OBA as kind of a good case study and comparator, and that'll cover the first paper. I'll then turn to the specifics of the draft outcomes framework and highlight particular questions that arise from that document, and, and that'll cover the second paper. Um, so, as members of the com committee will, will be aware, uh, outcomes-based accountability, or OBA, is a, a trademark system, um, first developed by an American academic called Mark Friedman. It works on two distinct levels, population accountability and performance accountability. So, first of all, population accountability is the broader of the two levels of OBA, and that, uh, that level of population accountability addresses the well-being of whole populations. So responsible organizations in our context, the Northern Ireland Executive and its departments and agencies, uh, first develop a set of desired outcomes that taken together are supposed to represent the long-term vision for the entire population. Indicators are then specified for each outcome and those indicators are supposed to provide quality and objective and reliable data which accurately represent progress towards the outcome. And then finally, all of those responsible organizations, again, as I say, in our case, the executive and its, its various guises, um, will develop and deliver action plans and strategies. And in the long term, all of that work in the action plans and the strategies is supposed to improve uh, all of those outcomes in the long term. So as I say, the executive's program for government is at this population accountability level. And the draft outcomes framework, which the committee will consider after this, it currently holds nine outcomes which, taken together, represent the executive's long-term vision for the population here. Um, so secondly then, performance accountability is the more specific or targeted of the two levels of OBA. Where population accountability deals with entire populations, and in our case that's the whole population of Northern Ireland, um, performance accountability addresses the well-being of specific client groups or specific target groups within that population. Um, one example used in the paper is all of the students at CAFRI. Another example might be all users of an advice helpline, but it really could apply to any, any piece of executive work at all. Um, in performance accountability, responsible organizations identify their client group, first of all, the impacts that they want for that group, and then finally, how those impacts can be best delivered and then measured. And then interventions or projects at the performance accountability level are then monitored using a, a report card of agreed measures. And those are based on a three-step structure that follows basically the delivery and the impact of the work that's being done. So first of all, uh, within that report card, the first element would be how much did we do and measures that are dealing with the quantity of effort or the quantity of the work done. The second element would be how well did we do it, um, and that deals with the quality of, of that work. And then finally, and most importantly, uh, there is the is anyone better off uh, measures. And they're supposed to be the most important step, and they deal with the impact of all of the work that was actually done and what actually happened as a result. So to take the example of uh, CAFRI students again, as in the paper, some of the things you might find in a report card which focuses on them would be uh, the number of students on a particular course, and that could be a typical how much measure. Um, the percentage of those students that were satisfied with their experience on the course or with, with CAFRI in general, and that's a fairly typical how well measure. And then in terms of the better off measures, you could have things like the number and percentage of participants gaining accredited qualifications or relevant employment. And that, as I say, is the most important thing. That's all about the impact of the work that was done. Um, so. That, uh, in terms of population accountability and performance accountability, that is the OBA approach, hopefully, in, in a nutshell. Um, and that's what's detailed in the first paper. In terms of the introduction of OBA into Northern Ireland, uh, members will be aware that it was first adopted by the executive for the 2016 draft programme for government. Um, and that had followed an OECD review of governance structures in Northern Ireland, which was published uh, a couple of years before that. Um, consultation on that first outcomes-based draft programme for government closed in December 2016. Uh, and of course, in, in the following January, 
the assembly and executive um, was suspended and entered a hiatus which lasted until january of 2020. during that time the civil service basically maintained the oba approach in a document that uh, they called the outcomes delivery plan um, and officials might, might kind of refer to that when they're up and they did that more or less because the OBA approach uh, was like the last instruction of outgoing ministers. So that OBA approach was uh, kept taken over um, in the absence of, of the Assembly and the Executive in that time. Um, in the new decade, new approach date of January 2020, uh, the parties agreed to retain the OBA approach in a new programme for government and also to develop a priorities plan of more short term actions. Um, since that point, the executive's response to the COVID-19 pandemic has delayed development of a new programme for government um, and uh, also any, any development of any priorities plan. And that basically brings us to the point of the draft outcomes framework. So that was published in January of this year. Uh, and I can't precisely recall, it's either just about the cruise consultation or it just has, but that's that's what the officials are here today for. Um, so that's where we are now. I'll, I'll now turn to a few of the limitations of OBA in practice, um, and in particular at the population accountability or the programme for government level of OBA. Um, so first of all, uh, in terms of attribution, at the, at the population level of OBA, it's difficult, if, if not impossible, to accurately attribute responsibility for, for positive or negative change on any outcome or indicator. Now, to, to put meat on that or to give an example of that, um, the example used in the paper is the Northern Ireland Composite Economic Index, and that's one of the indicators um, in the outcomes delivery plan and possibly in the 2016 draft programme for government. It's essentially an indicator which measures private sector output in Northern Ireland. So since 2015, that indicator initially, anyway, steadily and substantially improved, but it's very difficult to accurately attribute and divide the responsibility or the, the credit for that improvement. Uh, reasons could include uh, Department of Finance policies, Department of the Economy policies, or Invest NI policies or initiatives. And in fact, some of that improvement could be down to Westminster policies or global economic trends, which are entirely beyond the control of, of any part of the executive. Um, on the flip side of that, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has obviously um, caused necessary and enormous restrictions on public movement and trading, and that will and probably has significantly harmed this indicator. Um, that's an external event beyond the initial control of the executive, and so they obviously cannot be blamed for that dip in performance in this indicator. But that important contextual information isn't you know, actually reflected in the core data of the indicator itself. And I think that that difficulty with attributing or dividing responsibility is quite a major challenge for OBA at the level of the programme for government. If there's no way of accurately and robustly doing that, um, accountability at, at the level of the programme for government is significantly reduced. Any department or agency could theoretically claim credit for, for any improvements uh, on an outcome or indicator while blaming negative change in indicators on factors beyond their control. and it would be hard to unpick the accuracy of either position or to argue for or against it. Um, so secondly, then, there is a potential issue with uh, what are called perverse incentives. And I'll, I'll explain what that means. Um, so in OBA, as I've discussed, the first step is to define the outcomes. The outcomes are broad and aspirational and long-term statements. For example, one outcome in the draft framework, which was just consulted on, is we all enjoy long, healthy, active lives. So it's it's very broad. It's not there's no specificity to that in terms of uh, what what constitutes that exactly. And that's where the indicators come in. So progress towards that outcome at the program for government level is measured by the indicators to that outcome. It's the five or six indicators for each outcome that actually provide the detail and the measurement of of progress as such. However, that can create an environment of as I say, what are called perverse incentives. And that's where the executive and its departments and agencies and public bodies uh, can become focused on improving indicator data um, instead of on delivering the right services for the long-term outcome. The example used in the paper is from the Civil Services Outcomes Delivery Plan. Um, one indicator there is the number of households in housing stress. 
Uh, it's a housing executive statistic that members might be familiar with from casework and stuff. Um, a household is in housing stress if it gets more than 30 points on the social housing waiting list. So given what I've kind of laid out there, within the context of OBA, and as I say, in a context where the indicators are the only objective numerical data that actually represent delivery at the program for government level, strictly speaking, that would be rational for the Department for Communities to simply change the way the housing executive awards points instead of addressing the underlying issue of appropriate housing supply. So as I say, currently you need to have more than 30 points to be deemed in housing stress. If that was changed to needing more than 50 points, so if you needed to have an extra 20 points to be deemed in housing stress, that would, at the, at the stroke of a key effectively, reduce the number of households in housing stress and improve that indicator. And so that would improve performance on the indicator on the face of it, but without actually improving the circumstances of, of any of those households in that situation. And then finally, um, in a program for government with currently, as per the draft framework, nine broad and long-term outcomes, it's, it's inevitable that those outcomes will sometimes contradict or compete with one another. So for example, outcome two in the draft outcomes framework is we live and work sustainably protecting the environment. And outcome nine is people want to live, work and visit here. So for the purposes of this, that's essentially a, an environmental protection outcome and an employment outcome and for the, for the purposes of what I'll lay out here. It, it's quite easy to imagine a decision facing the executive or one or more of its departments or agencies, which would improve one of those outcomes, but harm the other. Um, for example, a, a significant inward investment opportunity could damage the environment, or conversely, higher environmental protections could deter that inward investment. And that could even be reflected in the indicators for those outcomes. So for instance, a single executive or departmental decision could improve the composite economic index, but it could also cause an increase in greenhouse gas emissions and, and damage that indicator. Now, that's not competing outcomes like that are inevitable in the program for government because of the the scale and the scope of what the program for government covers, because it covers the whole uh, run of public policy here. Um, that is inevitable. The point is where those arise, the decision making in that scenario will require judgments and influences and communication beyond the core OBA approach of the program itself. And that, that would need to be quite clearly communicated. Um, so I've kind of run through a few of the uh, potential challenges there of, of OBA. Um, after detailing some of those, it is worth pointing out the potential of the performance accountability level of OBA. So performance accountability, without going over everything talked about kind of at the top, it's the more specific and targeted level of OBA and it deals with specific target groups. Because that level is more immediate in terms of its impacts and its target groups, it could be potentially far more valuable to day-to-day -to -day executive administration and the assembly scrutiny of that. And um, members might recall that when I was briefing on international relations in February, uh, I'd suggested that the work of the Executives 3 Bureau could be assessed using that report card approach of uh, how much did we do, how well did we do it, and is anyone better off? So in theory, um, and within the framework of the Programme for Government, report cards like that could and, and should be applied to most areas of executive work. And if that were done, that could be the basis for meaningful performance management and scrutiny across the executive and within individual departments and agencies. And then also from the committee's perspective in, in the assembly's committee scrutiny of, of that work. Um, and that then brings me kind of to the, the Scottish experience of OBA. Um, so members might be familiar, but in, in the first paper, Scotland was considered as a case study of OBA in practice. Um, in theory, like Scotland's had continuous one party government since 2007. And since then, it's worked within uh, a national performance framework that utilizes the OBA approach. So in theory, over that length of time and with continuous uh, government, it's an ideal environment for OBA to be thoroughly enacted. And it was a, it seemed like a good case study to look at further and to see how far they'd actually gotten with it. Um, in practice in Scotland, we find that OBA is really only one of many influences on government administration and of parliamentary scrutiny of that. 
and it hasn't really been comprehensively or uniformly put into practice in, in either of those places. There are some useful uh, proactive lessons to be drawn from Scotland. The core questions and the core process of OBA can be embedded into scrutiny of uh, departmental activity. Um, and that could initially be piloted even in a committee context in, in one or two areas of work per legislative session or per mandate. Um, but fundamentally, the, the Scottish lesson really is uh, the, the complexity and the time required to do OBA fully as such in practice, either across the executive or across the assembly, shouldn't be underestimated. Um, doing, doing so would be really a long-term project and frankly, most likely over several mandates as well. Um, so that kind of covers the first paper. I'll now turn more briefly um, to the, the second paper, the note on the draft outcomes framework itself. Um, so the first item of note in the framework is the changes in outcomes since the 2016 draft program for government. Those are detailed fully in the brief note that, that members will have there. And the large majority are or appear to be quite minor changes in praise. Um, however, three outcomes were in the draft program for government in 2016 and are removed completely in the in the draft outcomes framework. And those are, uh, we have more people working in better jobs. We have high quality public services and we connect people and opportunities through our infrastructure. So essentially to, to summarize those, a jobs outcome, a public services outcome and an infrastructure outcome. There's no specific explanation for the removal of these outcomes in the draft framework. Uh, and I, I wouldn't want to get ahead of the explanation that TU officials would have. Um, so that might be something that the committee wants to seek further information on and why those removals and those changes were made. And then the other notable part of the draft outcomes framework is essentially the, the absence of detail beyond the nine proposed outcomes. Now, I will say that the executive does repeatedly define the framework as what they call, and I'm, I'm quoting here, what they call the critical first step in the development process. Um, and in response to an assembly question in, in early February, the first minister advised that the executive hoped to bring forward a, uh, a complete program, including key actions and strategies before this summer. Uh, but even in that context, a lot of detail is yet to be provided. Um, specifically, more information is required in, uh, in three areas. So firstly, in the draft framework, each outcome is uh, allocated a number of what are called key priority areas and then strategies. And taken together, those things essentially frame all of the actual work that will be delivered towards that outcome. Um, however, more information would be required on the timescales for the production and execution of those strategies. Uh, which departments and agencies would have lead or kind of contributory or feed in responsibility for different strategies and priority areas. Uh, and then finally, the delivery and monitoring mechanisms that will tie that whole structure together and tie everything from the work being done within individual departments and agencies right up to the overall program for government. And secondly, then in the in the draft framework, no detail is provided on who will uh, own or be accountable for each outcome or indicator. So in terms of the background of what was done on that front in the past, um, in the 2016 draft program for government, the head of the civil service was a senior responsible owner for the whole program. And then each indicator was allocated to a senior official. That changed um, after uh, the move to the civil services outcomes delivery plan. Um, in that context, each outcome was owned by an, what, what was called an outcome team. Um, so there were, I think, 11 or 12 outcomes in the uh, civil services plan. And each of those outcomes had a team which was chaired by a permanent secretary and then involved senior officials across uh, the relevant departments and agencies. Currently, uh, at the minute, and in the draft outcomes framework that um, has just closed for consultation, I think, uh, there's no ownership structure for outcomes or indicators. Uh, there, there's no outcome or indicator structure specified at all. And um, so the committee might want to seek more information on what ownership structure is proposed and, and the reasoning for that. And then finally, um, the last point, um, <clears throat> more information is required with regards to indicators. So I, I know I've touched a couple of times on the importance of indicators to uh, 
to the programme for government level of OBA. There are no indicators in the draft framework. Um, at an engagement event during the consultation and then in follow-up email correspondence with the research service, uh, TEO officials confirmed that they're not planning a, a public consultation on the indicators. So, as I say, I've discussed earlier the importance of those indicators to this level of OBA. They really are the only reliable, uh, meaningful data that tells us how we are doing. Um, even, even if it's not perfect, they're, they're all that there is in that sense at the level of the Programme for Government. Um, given that, the committee might want to seek more information on why no public consultation is being held on the indicators, um, how TEO will seek to ensure that those indicators are fit for purpose, and then finally, um, how committees will be engaged in that initial process and then in any future revision or change to outcomes and indicators. Um, so thanks very much for your patience. I, I know that was a, a decent sized briefing and covering two separate papers as well. So I'm happy to take any questions that members might have. Okay, um, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, that has been very useful and it certainly, um, you know, Stephen, you've taken a very complex issue and broken it down for us. Um, I suppose our, our, our timetabling has probably worked against us as uh, I'm sure Chris and Joanne and the others that are about to do the presentation will be scurrying off now to get all the answers to the points that you've just raised during the presentation there. Uh, but I, I, I'm sure that they would have had the answers anyway. But um, there, I mean, it is fairly straightforward. I, I think that the, the points that you've raised are, are very much there uh, as questions for us to ask in the next session. So um, I wouldn't take uh, a lack of members queuing up to ask you questions as any slight on the report. I think it'll uh, part the questions. I certainly know you've given me four or five to ask in the next presentation. But I do see that Pat has his hand up there, uh, the virtual hand up. Pat, do you have something you want to check there? I was just wanted to ask a general question about the consultation, Stephen, if that's okay. And I know it only closed there recently, but I'm wondering if you have any sense of the number of responses, uh, what type of response, and are there any emerging themes or issues, if you have any of that information? Thanks. Well, I have to say I don't. I'm, I'm sure that the TO officials would have kind of the, the at, at the very least the quantitative stuff, um, but uh, they, they would be able to brief on that next, I think. Okay, no problem. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. That's, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, George, come on ahead there. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Just a couple of points. <clears throat> I'll try to be as brief as I possibly can. Um, and excuse my ignorance, OBA, uh, could you elaborate on what OBA actually stands for and OBCD? Yes. Okay, excuse my ignorance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, that's okay. That's to, even, so um, OBA, uh, pardon me, I, I did I probably jump straight into the abbreviations there early on, but OBA is um, Outcomes-Based Accountability. Um, it, it, it was originally called Results-Based Accountability in, in the States, but it's essentially the, the system that it, the executive were using the program for government. Um, the OECD, I am not 100% sure of um, for what that stands for off the top of my head. Uh, I'll just bring it up in front of me. And, um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, what they are in essence is, um, or what they are in relation to this, um, they're essentially a, a, an international organization of, of uh, developed countries, basically. And in 2014, they provided a report to Northern Ireland that made some suggestions for the reform of public administration, kind of in the context of budget cuts and the need to uh, Perhaps more joined up approach to government, really. So that's that's where the OECD came in in terms of initially that move to outcomes based accountability. That's great, Stephen. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, that's grand. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Martina, yes. Um, Stephen, thank you. And I fear by the time it gets round to the rest of us that the chair will have used all your valuable information. Uh, to, to ask the questions to the officials, but that's his prerogative since he's sitting in the chair. Um, Stephen, I have to say I concur uh, with your analysis. Um, I found it uh, very informative. And I too will be interested to find out as to why the three outcomes that you mentioned around uh, jobs, public services and infrastructure. And I'm sure the officials uh, hopefully 
will be coming to this meeting to, to tell us that. In relation to data collection, Stephen, I'm wondering, have you found outside of the performance accountability that unless we, you know, if you can't, uh, if you can't measure it, you shouldn't cut it. So, you know, if we're not going to be able to use data to demonstrate to us that we're making a difference to people's lives, then I'm just wondering how, well, you know, what other measurement do we use? Because the, you answered the question for myself when you mentioned about the 2016 program for government and the OBA being used. And then, disappointingly, but you said, you know, currently it had made very little impact. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's, is that because the performance accountability wasn't able to be measured because of basically the way you described it, the report card, you know, how much did we do, um, how did we do it, and who benefited, that the data wasn't available to show who actually benefited. And, you know, when you consider the amount of money, public funding that's spent on policies and strategies and implementing these to make a difference to be people's lives, it is quite worrying and concerning uh, if we're not able to satisfy ourselves that what we are doing is making an impact. Mm -hmm. um, well, I suppose in terms of in terms of the data, there is, and again, I, I know that officials will be able to brief on this in, in a lot more detail than I can, of course. But um, there is the issue of data at the population accountability or the program for government level. And then there's the issue at the uh, that, that you're referring to at the performance accountability or the level of individual interventions. Um, I don't mean to, I didn't mean to be completely defeatist about the um, the indicator data at the population level. It's more that um, in the scrutiny of the program for government, uh, the, the committee and members more generally, and you know, and in, in your membership of other committees, should probably be aware that there are there are dangers and um, you know an indicator can very quickly become a target and can become a focus at the expense of other things so that is maybe the overriding um, danger or concern at the program for government level in terms of performance accountability it uh, Scotland was the case study used as I say because Scotland in theory is somewhere that should have been um, quite um, not not easy but it's one of the places where it should have been done more comprehensively or it was a very favorable environment. And um, it hasn't been done comprehensively, or as I say, but in theory, a, an OBA report card shouldn't be anything incredibly taxing to put together. And um, for instance, I know, um, as with many things, that the third sector and the charity sector is kind of at the front of a lot of this, and a lot of charities receiving, uh, for instance, DFC funding, and I'm kind of leaning on the past experience here, but they will have those report cards and then we've built into those contracts. So it can be done, but I think there's just uh, there's a there's a, a a large amount of complexity in uh, getting this approach in across all of the departments and all of the agencies and um, obviously it was in the 2016 draft program for government and it maybe lost a bit of political impetus with um, with the absence of of the assembly and executive for a wee while and um, so this is. Uh, I, I imagine the executive are treating this as the opportunity to try to push this out more. But again, I don't want to get ahead of what officials might say next. You know. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, and I think there's plenty of goodies in what he's given us there. Um, Retain it is spread around all of us in the next presentation. So, um, yeah, indeed. Look, Stephen, there, there are no other uh, people indicating questions there. So thank you very much indeed. I appreciate the work that you've done and in presenting what can be quite a complex issue to us there in a reasonable way. So thank you very much for that. Uh, mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll let you go. And um, while we're letting yourself go, we will... Uh, ask broadcasting to bring up i see we have chris stewart um jeffrey simpson and joanne cartlin and um, so if we want to bring the three of those individuals up for the presentation um so i think you are there i know um chris you're going to lead on this if yeah, yes, there you are. I can see you now. So um yeah, thank you. And we have Joanne and we have uh, Jeffrey there. And if members, we will bring members up maybe after the presentation 
uh, so that we can see everybody and get questions at that point, but members can put their, their hand up during the, the presentation. Um, so I'll take the opportunity to, to welcome the three of you to the meeting. Um, Chris Stewart, I see your job title has got slightly longer with more uh, detail in it. Is, uh, you're now the Deputy Secretary of Strategic Policy, Equality and Good Relations. So is that, if I can ask, is that, a, is that temporary or is that... It's, it's temporary, Chair. Um, okay. uh, the TEO is in a, in a bit of a state of flux, um, and, and all of this begins with the appointment of, of the new Hawks uh, and yeah. the plans then for some reorganisation within TEO that will will follow that. And you know that has come along just at the same time as uh, Dr. Mark Brown got promoted and, and went off to to education. So yes. temp temporarily, I, I'm still me, but I'm also Mark. Okay, well, there we go. And if, if there's any more changes, you'll be the last one there. So we blame you for everything, then, I think, is, is where we go. But, um, Chris, you're very welcome. And you're joined by Geoffrey, who is the Director of Programme uh, for Government uh, Department, there, and Joanne Cartland, who's the Principal Statistician. So, look, we'll do the usual. We, we'll pass over to yourselves, let you give us a bit of a presentation. And as I'm sure you've probably heard most of the questions that we're going to ask you anyway, but we'll get them warmed up for you afterwards. We have indeed, Chair. Thank you. I'll, I'll take the easy ones and the harder ones are for Geoffrey and Joanne uh, in, in due course. They'll be expecting that. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Uh, and you've already introduced uh, Geoffrey and Joanne. Thank you for that. I'm particularly pleased that they're both uh, with us today because I think they will, in all seriousness, be able to tell you uh, the answers to, to some of Stephen's questions. I think particularly around the development of indicators uh, and where that uh, work, work is going. Chair, if I could begin just with a quick overview of the work that we've been doing on the PFG. Members will have heard some of it before, uh, most recently when, when Geoffrey and I uh, attended on the 20th of January, and just before the launch of the public consultation uh, that, that Stephen uh, referred to. Uh, and he was quite correct, uh, it has indeed just, just ended, hasn't time flown, it doesn't seem like nine weeks uh, since we were, were starting that. Since then, things have moved on apace, uh, and we're now emerging from the other side of that consultation. And we believe it was both extensive and very successful, and we'll describe a bit more about that uh, in a moment or two. We had excellent levels of, of civic engagement, particularly given the, the constraints of, of the current environment and having to do things virtually. But we had a really good uh, level of discussion and, and debate with those who were involved. I'll ask Jeffrey to tell you about that in a little more detail uh, in, in a few moments. Well, first of all, if, if members would indulge me, uh, I'd just provide a bit of an overview in terms of where we are, how we got here, uh, and what our plans are for moving forward. And some of that will touch upon uh, some of the questions that, that Stephen suggested. So members will recall from last time that the executive decided just before Christmas to commence public consultation uh, to help inform the thinking around the design of the new uh, outcomes framework. And the intention being that when finalized and agreed, that new framework would provide a firm and lasting basis for a new program for government based on achieving positive outcomes of societal well-being. And you heard Stephen describe the concepts, I think, that, that, that underpin that. So the starting point for the public conversation was the draft framework, consisting, as you've heard, of nine draft outcomes and incorporating also some early ideas about what the executive's key priorities might be under each outcome. Again, as has been acknowledged, uh, there, there's more work to be done on that. So it's a framework that is informed by and draws feedback from stakeholders, as well as the lessons that learned from the earlier outcomes-based uh, work programs that you heard about, some public surveys, uh, the priorities identified in NDNA and the talks process that led to it, and of course, uh, a minister's very eventful uh, first year in office. Uh, but establishing that uh, outcomes framework uh, is an important step, but just the first step in the development process. There is more to be done, but it is the key to getting right uh, everything that follows. Ministers were very clear uh, in, in their uh, commission for us that they wanted the new PFG to be based on the principles of co-design and participation. So that's why we regarded the public consultation process as very important. We're now beginning to analyze consultation responses. It has just ended. And our aim going forward is to have a final version of the framework agreed by the executive, probably we think uh, in early May. And that then is with a view to bringing forward uh, a more complete program, the program in its entirety with uh, indicators, um, action plans, the lot. 
uh, before uh, the summer. Uh, don't press me too hard on, on what we mean by summer. Uh, the intention is that that uh, PFG framework will provide a firm basis for improving well-being for all. Uh, and of course, in order to do that, we recognise that it must take into account existing inequalities faced by uh, different sections of society. That's something that members have frequently emphasised to us. And also the opportunity to positively promote equality of opportunity. So alongside our consultation on the outcomes framework itself, there's an associated equality impact assessment consultation to determine the potential uh, impacts on the Section 75 groups, as well as the potential impacts on those living uh, in urban and rural areas. That consultation is running a little bit behind uh, the other one. That's because it has a different time frame. It'll run for a total of 12 weeks until the end of April, and that's in line uh, with, with the Quality Commission guidelines. So, of course, we need to pause a little bit until the completion of that consultation, because it's important uh, that any conclusions that we draw on the framework mm -hmm. are informed by quality considerations. So, finally, for me, just before I hand over to, to Jeffrey to say a little bit about the consultation, It'd be impossible to have a conversation about executive priorities and a PFG without mentioning COVID uh, and, and the response to that uh, to bring back some measure of societal normality. And the executive is currently working on a three-part approach to the immediate period ahead. So firstly, there's a need for a route map uh, to get us beyond lockdown, ease the restrictions on activities and, and, and movement. So that's the immediate priority, and that, of course, is taken forward by the Executive COVID uh, Task Force uh, headed by Jenny Piper. Secondly, the Executive will want to focus on some early decisions around the priori prioritization of things needed for the immediate recovery phase, building back the economy uh, and society as we move out uh, of lockdown and restrictions over the period between now and the end of, man of the mandate. And thirdly, of course, there's easing our way into a full outcomes-based PFG uh, delivery mode and, and approach with the introduction of all the things that were touched upon, actions, programs, strategies. Um, that work, of course, is underway now, but we see it really coming in, into, into fruition in the next uh, Assembly mandate. And those are the executive's top three priorities or top three areas of work at the moment. However, they can't be viewed in a strictly linear way. They are connected, uh, some mm -hmm. blending of all three will be a necessary part of bringing the new PFG forward. And that, I think, demonstrates the complexity of, of the environment in which, we, in which we are operating. And it gives a sense of the challenge uh, that we've been seeking to have the program ready to launch before the summer. And I think, as I said last time, that is actually uh, trying to do about six or sorry, about 12 months' work uh, in a little over six. Uh, so that is challenging. However, it will be a huge step forward to have an outcomes-based program mm -hmm. for government commenced and be able then to take a live and responsive approach in which we're not trying to do everything at once. Uh, and that provides us with the scope for the PFG to involve, evolve and be improved uh, as we move forward. And that's a core part of, of, of the revised approach that we're adopting now. Tara, that's all that I want to say at, at your point. Happy to add light and shade to that in, in response to members' questions. Uh, but perhaps at this stage, if I can ask Jeffrey to say a few words just about the consultation. Okay, thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as has already been alluded to by Chris, uh, ministers have been very clear that the outcomes-based uh, approach or the new pro outcomes-based program for government must be founded on a partnership approach between government and wider civic society. That means putting in place a framework for the new program that ministers and the executive can rely on when making strategic policy and long-term planning decisions and in designing future action plans, safe in the knowledge that it is a framework which has widespread support from people and communities everywhere. To do that, we need to develop a framework that is informed by close engagement with civic society, with people, groups and organisations who understand the needs of individuals and communities and who know what is needed to make a difference for people by achieving maximum input for, from services at the point of delivery. That is the context of the public consultation we have been leading. And it set a big challenge for us from the outset, how to reach out to everyone who might have something to contribute to the PFG. We did that in a number of ways. Firstly, in the design, content and language of the draft outcomes framework itself, as well as in all of the published consultation documentation. 
keeping the wording of the outcomes as short and clear as possible and avoiding corporate and technical terms. There are fewer outcomes than in the previous version as already has been noted, but we have introduced a new tier of key priority areas to emphasize where the focus of the executive's work programs will be on the reach outcome. We made both the framework and the consultation document available in a number of different formats, in Irish language and Ulster Scots, an easy read version and a child friendly version as well. We promoted the consultation through uh, the media on the Northern Ireland Executive website and by issuing news releases as well as through social media messaging and the use of newspaper advertisements in the daily and Sunday press titles. We also contacted around 600 stakeholders directly to advise them of the launch of the consultation and contact them again in the middle of the consultation process to remind them about it. And we prepared a promotional video involving all of the ministers speaking about the new program for government and encouraging people to engage in the consultation process. Then there were the consultation events themselves. In publishing the consultation document and at every opportunity, we made an open invitation to run online consultation events for groups or to speak to people to tell them about the PFG and the outcomes-based approach so, so that they could make the best possible consultation submission. The consultation opened on the 25th of January and it ran for eight weeks and only closed, as we've, we've discussed there, at midnight on Monday. During that period, we held 27 bespoke online engagement events with groups ranging in size from three people up to 170. In total, the events were attended by some 650 people with around 450 different organisations across a range of sectors and population groups being represented. As of today, we've received 421 responses to the consultation. The events have been hugely positive, and the level of discussion and debate has been impressive, and it leaves absolutely no doubt that there continues to be widespread support for the outcomes-based approach being taken to the PFG and the wellbeing agenda, which is at the heart of its approach. It's also very clear that there's a high level of interest in the partnership approach and a considerable number of people and groups at all levels have indicated their readiness to support the approach and to engage with the executive. The process is now underway to analyse the submissions that have been provided in response. And once that has been completed and after the consultation on the EQIA has been concluded and analysed, a revised version of the framework will be brought forward and work will then begin to prepare the action plans needed to, to begin delivering the programme. Sure, that's all I had to say by way of intro introductory remarks, but like Chris, and I'm sure Joanne too, happy to get into detail and to deal with some of those questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much indeed for that presentation. We appreciate that. We'll get um, straight into questions then, and I will begin uh, with, with some. Um, can I maybe ask about... Um, maybe take a two-pronged approach to this in terms of consultations. I, I frequently throughout my years as a councillor and, and now uh, as an MLA have a difficulty sometimes with consultations because it's almost like it's a, it's a model that has been developed that is presented and said, what do you think about this? And then generally what comes after will have very little change to it. And you've used terms that are like co-design um, and that there would be a heavy emphasis on a co-design process but would it not make sense that the co-design process nearly would have taken place to develop what would be consulted on as opposed to co-designing after you've designed, designed something? I mean, how do you think? I mean, I, I, I doubt that there will be too much change to what you've presented in the consultation to what actually is at the end because you, you've done almost most of the work. So how do you feel it fits in in a co-design process that you've you've basically done most of the work already. Chair, I, I very much welcome your confidence that the executive uh, will, will, will take the fruits of our labours and, and leave them unchanged. Uh, I'm not quite so certain that that will be, will be the case. Um, I'd maybe let Jeffrey and Joanne say a little bit more about the, the work that was done to develop uh, the, the proposals themselves before uh, they, they, they went for consultation. But I think I, I would want to assure you that it, it wasn't the case of us just sitting in a darkened room uh, and coming up with ideas uh, and then uh, and inflicting them uh, on the public. But perhaps I could just ask, ask Jeffrey or Joanne just to say a little bit more about the actual process of developing what we put for consultation. Okay, well, maybe I'll kick that off. Um, uh, Chris, I mean, 
Uh, as, as was alluded to by Stephen in his presentation, I mean, there's a bit of a long lead-in uh, to where we are now, and it started actually four years ago, 2016, and even further back uh, than that, uh, the work to develop the 2016 framework uh, began with a, a survey questions and, and, and processes around um, taking public views as to what matters most uh, to people. So that goes right back to 2015. And that led to the development of the 2016 draft framework. Uh, and of course, we, we did have the opportunity to run with that in a sort of semi-live environment through the outcomes delivery plan. And we learned some lessons from, from what worked well and what, what, what maybe didn't in that. But the work on the perception of outcomes has continued. And there was survey work carried out by NISRA throughout um, the period since then to, to, to continually assess people's views of that. Um, so that, that has been a starting point for that. Um, there was also in the autumn period, we, we did engage in a, in a round of internal and external engagements as well in the early autumn period to sort of re reassess some of uh, the thinking around the framework. And some of that was fed into the design of the new framework. Um, and some of the lessons we learned were, for example, the need to keep the outcomes themselves quite simple, quite high level. Um, short and to the point, and to broaden the reach of those, the challenge for us in central government is to break out of the departmental silos. And if you go into too many um, outcomes, you're going to fall back down into the silo approach again. So one of the things we've done with the new outcomes and the way we've, we've come up in this time is to broad, broaden out their reach so that they will stretch for quite naturally across um, a, a, a number of, uh, of departments. Um, so that's that's been an important lesson learned. We also ran, and, and uh, Joanne, I'm sure I want to say something about this, a series of focus groups um, uh, with different section, section 75 uh, groups represented as part of that to test the views of people as to what should be in the outcomes uh, and where the disadvantages and, and so on should be within that. And Joanne, maybe you want to pick up on that and, and just say a wee bit more about that. Can't hear you there, Joanne. Are you unmuting yourself there okay? Oh. No. Um. Can, can I, I think, Joanne, can I guide you up to, uh, at the very top of the screen, there's the word more, and if you click on that, underneath it is the word AV settings, and if you click on that, it will open up and tell you which microphone, it needs to be your built-in microphone that is selected from the drop-down box. So that's more AV settings, and then if the microphone, just to make sure that it's the built-in microphone that's Sure, sure, maybe I'll carry on. And yeah, I, mean, okay. I mean, I've already touched on, on the waters, uh, what matters most uh, focus groups, but there were 51 participants to that, which was quite a small uh, number, but it did stretch across um, all of the sort of targeted demographics. Uh, yeah. in Northern Ireland covered so all of the Section 75 groups, 10 different focus groups, including groups involving children as well. So it did encompass a fairly broad range of views. It's only a representative sample, and it gives us a sense uh, of, of where we were headed and, what, and, and some of the, the things that we needed to think about uh, and moving forward. Okay. Okay. Um, and maybe then just in terms, um, Chris, of the process, um, I mean, obviously, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to argue with any of the outcomes because they're all wonderful. You know, right? of course they are. It's, it's, you know, we want cleaner communities and we want people to live brilliantly and have wonderful lives and, and and I don't mean that as flippantly it's going to be that but whenever you consult on that you know it it really to me feels like it's going to be the how we achieve that is what we should actually be consulting on because that's where you might get into the meat and bones of people saying well I think we'll achieve that by doing this and somebody saying well no I think we'll achieve it by doing that and and there can be that discussion but really is there I mean do you you mentioned in, in the process that 
that this would be sort of signed off and completed by May, and then you would have all the indicators attached to it by by June, which means that there would be no consultation on the indicator side. So, how do we how do we discuss what's going to be in those indicators? I'll come, I'll come back on the indicators if I may, and uh, if we can if we can find a way of, of uh, getting Joanne's words, uh, she, she could say more more on that. But I think your your core point is an absolutely uh, correct one. It's not enough just to have a, an outcomes framework. Uh, yes, they are high level statements of good things, uh, which one would hope a few people would disagree with. Mm. The phrase that I usually use um, uh, should be copyrighted, I think, by by Alistair Hamilton. The, the ropes need to touch the ground. We need to be able to show people how we're going to achieve these outcomes. Otherwise, they are just aspirational uh, statements. That's why I think, as, as has been emphasized, um, the, the, the action plans and, and the key priorities underneath that uh, need to show people these are the steps that the executive is going to take in order to deliver those outcomes. Uh, and of course, individual strategies themselves will be subject to co-design and development and, and consultation uh, as they go through. Uh, and you know, it's, it's easy to see what some, and this is not an exhaustive list, uh, of the key ones will be you know, an anti-poverty strategy, an economic strategy, the strategies that, that deal with, with the recovery from, from COVID, uh, climate change. You know, those will all be subject themselves to, to consultation uh, and uh, the development processes uh, going forward. I think that also gives part of the answer to one of, one of the points that, that Stephen raised, which is, you know, where are the indicators in all of this? Yeah. And he, he quite rightly said that from time to time in the past, there was maybe a bit too much focus on the indicators. They also be, almost became regarded as, as outcomes or, or targets in, in, in their own right. Uh, and, you know, that takes you in the direction away from, from what it is that we're trying to achieve. So the indicators will be there. Uh, they, they remain very, very important. It is essential that we have them. But they need to be correctly positioned in all of this. So we'll be looking to give them a bit less prominence and give a bit more prominence to the statements of key priorities and the identification of, of uh, the action plans. On the indicators themselves, I, I will attempt to answer it, but I, I, we, this really does need Joanne's expertise on it. Um, why are we not consulting on it? Why is there not more of a, a co-design process on, on indicators? Well, the, the indicators need a degree of robustness that is you know, very high indeed. They've got to be reliable. They've got to be valid. They really have to have, I'll keep watching Joanne and why she's nodding, I know I'm giving the right answer. They need really to have the, the status of official statistics or at least a, a similar level of, of rigor uh, uh, within them. And, you know, with no disrespect to those who, who, who might want to, you know, offer a view on, on what we should be counting, that's actually quite a high bar. That's quite a significant challenge. Uh, and uh, there is a limit, I think, to what we can do in terms of co-design uh, around the indicators uh, if, if we're going to get what we can actually use uh, as, as a measurement tool going forward. Joanne, if she's able to, will describe that rather better than I have. No. No, she won't. All right. Okay. Perhaps an extreme share. If, if we could free Joanne to use the chat function, she might be able to get us a crisp sentence or two on that. Right. Because I can maybe add why that's happening. Um, there, there is actually a technical assessment panel established that's leading that review, so it is. So that involves senior statisticians at NISRA. Uh, as well as chief, the chief economist uh, and senior policy people in departments, and they are, um, um, you know, doing doing things like drawing international comparisons with best practice and so on. Uh, in in relation to that, they they have a very tight framework of um, of measures that they're using to 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 test each of the indicators in terms of what, what are they straightforward and simple to interpret. Uh, is the data precise enough? Is, can it be disaggregated by different Section 75 groups and so on? So there's quite a robust process being going through there. And also, maybe just worth mentioning that it, it is a live program for government that we're hoping to move into in a live environment. There will be a live monitoring and reporting website. The indicators do do what they say they are. They give an indication of progress, but what's almost more important is the information that sits in behind that and the interpretation that's put on that and the explanations uh, that sit around that. So all of that will be available on the website and the outcome owners will be in, uh, will, will, will have to stand over uh, that progress and, and have to stand over what they're saying in response to that as well and what they're doing about uh, indicators that are not um, progressing the way, way it's anticipated. 
Chair, if I, if I can give you a specific example of that, because it's not that people don't express views to us on this. They do, of course, and, and, and we listen to them. When we had suggestions, for example, that in, in, in the area of community relations, that we might include indicators uh, such as numbers of painted curbstones, uh, numbers of numbers and types of, of flags flown, uh, the, you know, that kind of thing. Now, those may well give you uh, a snapshot at any point in time uh, of uh, the state of community relations, perhaps in any particular area or perhaps even right across the jurisdiction. But what they cannot do is tell you at a population level over a long period uh, where, where things are going. They're very volatile. Uh, you know, one, one difficult marching okay. season will, will put those indicators in a particular uh, particular place. So, you know, we can well understand why there might be a desire for that kind of thing. It's, it's easily measured and, and probably fairly easily understood, but it actually doesn't do what, what we need it to do, which is to tell us what the long-term societal outcomes are. And that's just a different different level of challenge. Okay, look, I, I'm going to bring in some of the other me members now, but I, I suppose... Um, I don't think there's not necessarily a, a correct answer to this, but I just feel that while we're consulting on questions like people want to live, work and visit here, it's like the alternative is that, well, okay, the sector and out there has designed that they don't want people to live here, work here or visit here, that, that they're kind of fairly obvious statements and that people will feel somehow or other that they want to be consulted on the indicators, which is how we achieve that, um, and that, that that bit is going to happen very quickly in the space of four or five weeks with no public consultation, but we'll have spent maybe five months consulting on whether people think that's a good outcome or not. I don't know how you square that circle, but it's just that's, that's where I have a little of uneasiness that all of the, the real work of what's going to become the programme for government is just going to happen with no consultation and the wee simple bits that nobody really is going to disagree with have gone out for the public consultation but I can accept that maybe to go out and do a consultation on all of the indicators could cause a lot of problems but I I'm going to move on um, Martina I, I know is indicating and George I can see as well uh, for some questions there. Martina would you like to go on ahead? Um, thank you and uh, thank you all for, for the presentation um, can I ask because I know you were listening um, earlier about the, the three outcomes on jobs public services and infrastructure. Um, why were the three outcomes removed? Because while other ways throughout the draft uh, framework, uh, Sinn Féin would like reassurance that no key policy objectives are diminished uh, by, by this reduction of the overall number of outcomes uh, and that they will remain key priorities for the executive, particularly in the context of recovery from the pandemic and infrastructure uh, should be used to tackle regional inequalities and regional imbalance. So could you give us an understanding as to why these three outcomes were removed? Yes, certainly. Um, uh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and you've made a very valid point. In fact, it's one of the principles that, that guided us in developing that, which is that we shouldn't lose any key priority out of this. There, there are a couple of reasons for it. And actually, Jeffrey has alluded to, to some of it um, earlier. We didn't want to reduce the overall coverage of the outcomes, so and we hope that we haven't. So everything that was in the, 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 the previous outcomes is covered by a smaller number of outcomes now. But what we've tried to do is to make them, as Jeffrey said, simpler, clearer, uh, with, with much simpler language. And I think actually the more important reason for doing it is the one that Jeffrey described. We wanted to break the sort of one-to-one -one relationship between uh, an outcome and, and, depart and a department because that uh, promotes a sort of silo, silo type approach. All of the outcomes are, are cross-cutting uh, to a very, very large degree. Delivering them requires coordinated input from lots of departments and, and the agencies. Uh, and we feel we have more chance of doing that if we see each outcome as not simply being owned by or the business of one department, but actually being something that the executive decides uh, is a priority, and that all departments then in serving the executive have a shared responsibility to ask themselves the question, what can we contribute, not just to the outcome that's closest to us, uh, but to all of those in, in which we can, can, can play a part. If I could illustrate that maybe with, with an example, um, one of the strategies that I think that will, will underpin 
uh, the, the economic outcomes will be an energy strategy that the colleagues in the Department for the Economy are, are looking at. Clearly, that's closely related to, to climate change uh, and the work that will be being, do being done there and, and, and led by DERA. An energy strategy is likely to look at how we might decarbonise uh, road transport uh, and, and, and traffic. Uh, and, and as part of that, uh, I'm sure that the, the, the indicators will include uh, analysis of, of air pollution data. Now, you can combine very easily the air pollution data with health data on things like asthma and other respiratory diseases. And by doing that, and actually without a great deal of additional work for departments, you can demonstrate what an energy strategy will deliver in terms of the health outcome, or at least a certain dimension of it. So, you know, that is something where if we just have the silos, if energy is just seen as the business of, of economy and if health is just seen as a, as a business of health, then we would miss a real opportunity to do something in an energy strategy that will, that will contribute to economic growth, uh, dealing with climate change and also the promotion of respiratory health. And that's the sort of thinking that we're trying to engender with the new approach to the outcomes. I think I appreciate what you're saying up to a point, but I still don't concur with the view that um, the jobs, infrastructure or public services in any way could be identified as silos. And I, I, I'm just concerned and I still want to express that concern that they are not reflected of any, as any of the outcomes. Um, can, I, can I ask you in relation to housing, why is housing not included as a stand alone objective? You know, despite being required in, uh, by NDNA? Well, of course, it, it, it may be. Um, as I said to the chair earlier, I, I admired his confidence uh, that the, the executive would uh, take the nine that, uh, that, that we might suggest. There's a political choice to be made there. The executive may well decide uh, that, that housing should be a standalone outcome, uh, and there are lots of, of, of strong arguments for that. Uh, it, it did, of course, feature in NDNA, and it did, of course, feature in, in the talks process that led to it. But it is for the executive and due course to decide what goes in. Okay. Because um, like, I just want to put in the record, obviously, absolute support, the outcome-based accountability. But even though I was noting what you said in relation to you know, the, high, the high bar that would be set and the challenges um, if we did the reporting chart, but anybody that gets funding from any government department, is expected to do a reporting cards. So like if the community voluntary sector and any other sector that wouldn't have the same kind of capacity that you would have within um, you know, 26,000 more civil servants, then you would expect that we would be able to at least measure that we're making a difference to people's lives. And by these policies, they, the performance indicators being crucially important. Uh, in relation to the matter of the the objective for safety, it's addressing, which thankfully it is, uh, tackling sectarianism. But the outcome does mention other forms of discrimination, such as the LGBTQIA plus community, or by all peoples across the Section 75 categories. And we know that in the area of disability, we hear from lots of people um, in relation to how they are experiencing, but actually, you know, are treated uh, in a way that is absolutely categorised as being discriminated against by by some agencies, um, whether it's in a certain way or not. So uh, I was concerned just that safety had the the issue of tackling sectarianism in it, but it wasn't broad enough. Wasn't broad enough. Again, you know, I think that in, in due course, there's there's a political choice to be made there by the executive in terms of, of exactly what it what it uh, wants to include there. But there's always a trade-off, I think, between simplicity, uh, particularly simplicity of language, and comprehensiveness uh, in, in this. And you know, by definition, the more comprehensive we we make them, and all the things you've mentioned are absolutely valid. Uh, then, then the more challenging it is to keep the level of, of simplicity. The other way to put that question, I suppose, is where, where do you put the detail? Because it has to appear somewhere. The mm -hmm. approach that we've taken, I think, envisages less of the detail at the level of outcomes and more of the detail at the level of, of key priorities and action plans and even more still in, in, in the priorities um, underneath. For someone to understand, you know, what, what, what is the executive going to do over a mandate? You know, we need to we need to have that thread running right through from program for government 
the investment strategy, the action plans, key priorities, and all the supporting and delivery strategies uh, underneath. Now, the executive might well take the view that you know there, there are certain priorities that just don't have enough prominence uh, at present in the outcomes framework, and if that's the case, uh, we, we'll adjust it accordingly. Well, I'm glad to hear, uh, listening to you, Chris, that obviously you aren't only in listening mode, but uh, there's a few from yourselves that the executive is going to be hearing as well the, um, the over the 400 odd responses that have come in in the kind of consultation that has taken place. And I, I do favour co-design. Uh, you have to have those who are experiencing whatever it is that you're trying to engage with them on uh, in the room and, and designing the strategy. And to that end, can I finally ask Chair Lucas, because I know I have too many questions to ask here, but um, is there going to be a commitment that the programme for government will tar will be targeted based on objective need as agreed for in NDNA? You know, objective need needs to be central uh, to how we, we are governed, I think, and therefore, you know, this will allow resources to be targeted and we will be able to then measure that we are making a difference to people's lives. Because if we don't do that, then all of this is fluff and no substance. I think the reassurance we could give you on that is that absolutely central to the approach is to ensure that, that the indicators are capable of analysis to, to um, test that very thing. So they're capable of analysis by Section 75 group uh, and by sub-regional geographical location. So, uh, you know, although they are primarily population level indicators for the very reason you've given there needs to be capability of analysis mm -hmm. uh, at a level of detail underneath that and yes we're absolutely building that into uh, the development of the, of the indicators and also and again this takes me back to your co-design point to make all of that data accessible to stakeholders so it's not something that'll be hidden away and, and just for us it'll be on the website It'll be there. It'll be capable of analysis by stakeholders and for them to continue to feedback to us on an ongoing basis and to tell us what is working and what is, and what is not. We emphasize one of the key differences between this PFG and, and the previous one is this one isn't, isn't fixed over a fixed time period, uh, take it or leave it chiseled into stone. It's a living document on, on the web. Uh, the executive during the course of the mandate, taking that feedback, will want to adjust it and, and, and change it. Uh, in terms of, of the evolving situation and the priorities that are there. Okay, Chris, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Tab Martina. And I suppose, again, just some of the points, Chris, that Martina is making there, like, you know, if you're wanting to put forward that, you know, an indicator for housing, you, you can't do that in this because it's outcomes. It's not, you know, it, it, the indicators are nearly where I think we as politicians want to be able to have the influence to be able to say we want to see these indicators delivering those outcomes. But it's like we're being consulted on the bit that nobody's disagreeing with and not getting a chance to discuss. But I think maybe what we'll do is we'll press you to come back whenever you do develop those indicators so that we can interact with you at, at that stage. Um, George, you were looking to come in there for a question. Thanks, Chair. I'd like to do here two questions. And uh, I'd like to thank Chris, Joanne and Jeffrey for the presentation. My first question would be, and how much has the COVID situation impeded your work? And secondly, um, we all very, very recently filled in uh, census forms. And I was <clears throat> just wondering, is there any consultation can be done through those forms there, or not privy to the type of information which could, could help to uh, form a programme for government? I'll, I'll let Joanne come back uh, maybe on, on, on the census uh, point. On, on, on your first point, I suppose the short answer is it probably cost us about six months. Um, we were you know, just gearing up for this when, when COVID came along. So around about this time last year, I had to break the news to, to Jeffrey and Joanne and the team that we had to suspend uh, most of the work that we were doing on the Programme for Government uh, and go off and do uh, COVID work, uh, which, which the team did, uh, along with many others for around about six months. So we really, we really only started back into this work again in, in the autumn, around about September time. Uh, so we've been running to catch up um, uh, ever since. We're a bit off where we, where we would like to be. Um, I mean, ideally you'd want the program for government kicking in for the beginning of the fin financial year. It's gonna be a bit behind that, the best one in the world. Um, I, I've said early summer, I mean, we'll aim for sort of June or July, uh, something around, around that. 
that's not ideal, um, but it's better than not having having one uh, at all. In terms of the census, John, uh, if she's able to get on, will keep me right on this, but I, I think it'll probably be as much as a year before the census data has been through the sort of level of analysis that um, gets it to the point where, where, where we can start use it, using it. But then, like a number of other rich data sources, it will absolutely start feeding into our analysis of how the program for government is going and, and, and what it's delivering. Uh, it's a very rich and, and important source of information. Thanks very much, Chris. Okay. Um, any other members for questions? I don't see any others indicating there. So yes, sir. Uh, I can't. I think I'm hearing Christopher. Yeah, there we go. Now I'm seeing you. Yes. Yes, ahead, thank Christopher. You. Uh, thanks very much, and thank you for the presentation and the answers um, thus far. Um, obviously, one of the themes that's been identified is the COVID recovery strategy. I just wonder if I could take your mind. Um, in my view, one of the things that has been frustrating, particularly for the public, uh, in relation to our own local COVID re recovery strategy, is the absence of dates. And um, in terms of outcomes and delivering outcomes, how useful do you think it would be that the the recovery obviously is going to have various outcomes attached to that? But if we were to date those and basically be in a position whereby we're saying, you know, it is the government's aspiration that by X date, the following milestone will have been passed in terms of assisting the recovery of the economy and the, the more fuller delivery of public services, particularly health services. I was very enthusiastic about, I mean, I've served on this committee continuously since 2016, and so therefore I, I'm familiar with the outcomes-based accountability model, and I was very enthusiastic about it because I think actually what it does is it does set effectively in stone, this is what the government intends to do, and therefore the public can judge us against that if we have failed to deliver it. And I'm just wondering in terms of just COVID recovery, obviously wouldn't have been an element of the, the programme, you know, a year ago, but now it is. Um, just wondering how you would classify the importance of dates being part of that. I think the, the, maybe the first caveat that I should give is that there there are I think three three phases to that or or, or three strands and, and we're only actually involved in, in one of them. Uh, that's the longer term um, uh, PFG. The two strands before that. So I mean there's there's the immediate roadmap out of out of restrictions and then the one in the middle is is the COVID recovery strategy. On the first of the three, you'll have heard many times the, the reasons given for for not putting dates into it. Uh, and you know that's that's a choice that the executive made, based primarily on on the advice from uh, Chief Medical Officer and, and Chief Scientific Advisor. And I think we're all very conscious of of the degree of frustration that that leads to, for particularly economic stakeholders um, who, are, who are looking for for some some certainty. Um, on, on the middle one, uh, I said it's not something that we're directly involved in, in delivering, but uh, I think uh, at the risk of perhaps straying into territory that my, my colleagues uh, might not thank me for, I think there is a stronger or at least a different case for dates in, in that. So if the executive's recovery strategy, which is you know, looking at that, that period beyond uh, the, the point where restrictions are lifted, but looking at the actions that are being taken to build back the economy, to restore the delivery of public services, to restore all, all the facets of, of normal life and civic society that we all want to get back to. I think there's a stronger case for, for having dates in, in that part of the strategy, because by definition, that's at the point beyond restrictions. Restrictions have been lifted. Uh, life uh, is returning to normal, uh, and that strategy is all about what the executive is trying to do to, to accelerate that. So I, I, I think as we move through the phases, I think the likelihood of there being dates um, increases. I also think just beyond the, the sort of COVID element of the, the programme for government, I think there's an argument for dates throughout. So if, for example, there's a housing target and it's, you know, the executive plans to build, I don't know, 10,000 10, new homes in Northern Ireland over the course of an assembly term. You know, the important part of that is over the course of an assembly term, but the important part of that commitment. So um, I think it's important just as a general principle, 
in relation to COVID, obviously, but as a general principle, I think it's important that we have, you know, dates so that people can then, you know, whether it's, you know, by the end of this term, then people can then say to us, right, well, we're at the end of this term, how do you do? I think that's important. Sure, if I, if I, if I could cut in on that, just um, uh, Stephen, in his, in his very good description of the outcomes-based approach through the distinction between population level indicators and then the performance level um, measures that would be applied to individual programs. So if, for example, it was a house building program, that would be a program at performance level, not at population level. So there would be absolutely a, a case to be made for having dates at that, at that level. Uh, in terms of measuring how much you do, you, we, we did and how well did we do it, is anyone better off and so on. But that could very much lend itself to that. And that's something that would be brought into all of the actions when the action plans are brought in. So dates can very much be a feature at that, part, uh, at that point. Yes, we can. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just going to bring uh, Pat in shortly, but before I do, Chris, just to let you know, I think Joanne, you joined us now by phone. Can we hear you okay? Um, very much open. So, can you hear yes, me all right? We can, we can indeed. We can indeed. So, look, we've got you there that if you need to come in on any of the other questions from here on, there's still a few more members with questions. So, just to let Chris know that he can, can draw from you. So, Pat, Absolutely. do you want to go ahead? Apologies. We are. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I wanted to come in also on the issue of the action plans, because as the Chair said at the outset, you know, we, we all agree with the outcomes or objectives or whatever they are, you know. Uh, there, there's, there's no difficulty with those. The difficulty arises when we ask, well, how do you propose to get to that outcome? Uh, and that's where the action plans come in. And, and, and this is where I think accountability comes in. Because, uh, you know, we, we need to be able to ask ministers, well, you've said you're going to build 10,000 houses. Uh, let's see what your plan is, because under the current uh, restrictions around the housing executive and so on, that just can't happen. So the minister brings in a plan for complete transformation of the housing executive and other uh, issues connected with that as well. So we're then able to hold the minister to account uh, in, in regard to that action plan. So in terms of all the other departments, and I mean, a lot of it is all cross-cutting, as you've said, Chris. So when do these action plans actually come into play and, and when can we start holding ministers to account in regard to those action plans? Thanks. Well, those I would see being part of the overall package of, of the PFT that we need to have in place or aim to have in place by, by the summer. Um, because you, you're absolutely right. If we just if we just stop at the outcomes delivery framework, then you know we, we might have a sort of very high level statement of, of motherhood and apple pie that, that nobody would disagree with. We have to carry that on through and demonstrate uh, how how that is going to be delivered. Now, part of that, of course, involves some very difficult political choices um, for ministers and and for the executive, particularly I think in the current budget climate uh, that, that, that we're in. Uh, you know, the question of prioritization, I think, will inevitably arise. And the executive is currently looking at what its priorities will be for the remainder of the mandate, which isn't too far away. Then on the other side of the election, I think a, an incoming executive will need to look at that program for government, change it as it sees fit. But even with a not to say, you know, what are the What's, what's the prioritization of this going to be? It simply wouldn't be possible to move all of those outcomes forward at the same pace to, together. Choices will have to be made. And as you said, there's an accountability then on firstly on those choices and then the delivery of whatever the associated actions are. But the short answer to your question is we think uh, we're, we're aiming for a complete program for government action plans indicators by the summer. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. And and just in terms of the consultation, I was asking Stephen in the previous uh, presentation, have we any indications of you know how many people have responded, any themes or issues emerging? Is, I know I know it only closed there recently, but is there any information of that nature? Thanks. 
I'll let Jeffrey give you give you yeah. the figures and, and maybe some of the themes, uh, some of the themes that that I heard coming through just and and some of the the engagement sessions. Uh, you know the point point made by by members. What about housing? Where should it feature? Uh, should it be uh, an outcome of its own, or, or should it should it be a key priority? A theme that came through from time to time in a number of sessions was. Uh, you know there is an outcome that, that focuses on on early years on, on the development for for children and young people so many people asked you know why not a specific outcome for for older people uh, and that that argument was was made by the commissioner for older people uh, and others uh, very cogently that's all uh, important um input that we need to feed back to the executive and present the results of consultation and then allow the executive to to make those choices. So the executive might well decide to have a specific outcome on housing, might well decide to have a specific outcome for uh, older people. I think our advice would be, uh, you know, the thinking that went into the draft that was consulted on would, would still be our view, which is you could very quickly have so many indicators that there are so many outcomes that the prioritization becomes well nigh impossible. Uh, and you risk just creating a, a whole load of silos. But those are political choices, and the executive will, will make them in due course. Jeffrey might just uh, give us a wee bit of data on, on the numbers. Yeah, yeah, the numbers are, are 420 in at the minute. So, uh, yeah, with 27 events uh, that we took part in, 650 people have engaged in that. Um, that, that takes you so far. Uh, a lot of that was because we also explaining the outcomes framework. The real detail will come when we get into analysing what people have said in the responses. But um, Chris is right. There was a, there was a number of themes came through there, and I would add to those just in, in, in things of a, a general nature, uh, the importance of tackling inequalities within each which with, with, within each outcome, identifying what those inequalities are, recognising that not, not everyone's starting from the same uh, base in relation to the outcomes. You know that came through a number of times. Um, the, the question of hate crime and tackling sectarianism, but where is the racial uh, element of that? And we heard that at a number of events uh, as well, so that came through very strongly. And then the other thing was COVID and the impact of that and the expansion of the gap that exists maybe between, uh, in, particularly in, in the wealth uh, gap that, that's there maybe as a result of COVID, you know, so that came through a number of times as a general theme in addition to a, a lot of the things we've already discussed um, there, the housing, the need for, for good jobs and so on. Um, there was maybe debate around those uh, rather than you know people necessarily saying we need an outcome on this or an outcome on that. They wanted to know where it was within the outcomes uh, and, 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 and to identify what their key priorities were under each of the outcomes. And very often that, that um, assays to me, you know, many of the uh, sort of doubts that people had about where the priorities lay. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Pat. Uh, could I ask Emma to ask a question there? Emma, hi. Hello, and apologies. I've been dropped on a meeting. I've had broadband issues, so um, apologies in advance if this had been um, covered by anyone else because I did miss some of your presentation and some of the question and answer session. So thanks to you all for for joining us this afternoon. I had a question. Um, there's a, a focus in the, the speaking notes you provided around the EQIA that's going to be completed and the rural needs assessment um, post-consultation. I know the consultation is only closed two days. I wondered, I'd be interested, obviously, as a as a rural MLA in seeing the, the outcomes of that. I wondered if that would be... Just give us the end of your question there again, Emma. You, you said you were wondering if the outcomes would be... Sorry, it's maybe my broadband. Just if it would be available to the committee. Oh, yeah, Chris. Uh, Chair, indeed, certainly. Uh, I'm tempted to say maybe we should have an outcome or at least an indicator on broadband coverage, but uh, maybe that's <laughs> something I'll pass back to uh, economy colleagues. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, more than happy to engage uh, with, with the committee on the outcome of the consultation on the framework itself uh, and on the EKI when, when it comes back. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll bring that back to you. There, there will be consultation reports published as well, uh, both on the consultation and the EQIA, so that will be publicly available um, also at the end of the process. Okay, Emma. Yeah, I have one more question, mm -hmm. and again, apologies if this is already... 
Can you hear me? Everybody yes, go on ahead. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, everybody else is frozen for me, but I'll wait. Um, I just wondered if um, I'm the, the chair of the Anhau Committee on the Bill of Rights, and obviously that's something that's been there in the ether for over 20 years at this stage. I wondered in terms of consultation, and I know you've you've given some outline of things that are recurring themes, how much that has, has featured um, as a priority. Sorry, I missed the very start of the question. Uh, I, I think the question... Chris, if I picked it up right, yes. was um, yes. how, how, to what extent has the Bill of Rights featured yes. as a theme coming through during the consultation? Uh, and from, from the events point of view, I, I personally have not heard that raised during the events, but the events only scraps the surface. Um, in, in the 420 responses we've got, uh, uh, you know, very, very possible or likely that there'll be, there'll be more detail in there, and we'll certainly be looking out for that along with every other issue that's raised through the consultation or through the responses. Okay, um, right, Emma, is that you, or would you like? I think we 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 can normally get that you're happy enough. Okay, okay. Um, I think then, um, folks, the only one that hasn't asked a question is if Trevor Clark wants to ask a question there, but he hasn't indicated. But well, there you go, Trevor. Would you like to ask anything there? No, no, I'm fine. I'm happy enough. Just, just indicate I'm happy enough. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, well, look, um, thank you very much to um, to Chris, to Jeffrey, and to Joanne. Unfortunately, Joanne, I know we're, we're going to get to your committee meeting one of these days, and we'll we'll get we'll get hearing from um, your perspective. But look, I hope that maybe just on the back of what you've you've said, is there about this process, Chris, that maybe we could get you back again uh, in late May or, or early June to look at just how those indicators. Uh, are developing and and you know how the action plans are developing from uh, what's been consulted at this stage and I, I would think that members would have a, a lot of advice and guidance to to offer at that stage which might be very useful to yourselves so um, if you're happy enough we we'll leave it for there today uh, uh, thank you for your work and look forward to seeing you again uh, later in the year thank you sir thank you members thank you okay Thank members, I'm going to suggest a two-minute uh, two comfort break just while we swap the um, speakers around. So uh, just a, a very quick break for two minutes if people want to grab a coffee or some water or whatever, and we'll get restarted again then. Yeah, okay, so that's us back again. So, uh, members, we'll move on to item seven, which is the EU exit from the UK exit from the EU and the post-Brexit transition, and it's an oral evidence session with business organisations, and the information is available for members on page 118 to 181 of the meeting pack. And maybe if we could ask uh, Broadcasting to bring Fergal O'Brien, Angela McGowan, and Michael Darcy up into the um, spotlight for us. And we can... Uh, perfect, there we go. So I can take the opportunity to welcome the three of you to our committee meeting. Uh, we have Fergal O'Brien, the Director of Policy and Public Affairs at IBEC, Anza McGowan, who's the Director of CBI Northern Ireland, and Michael Darcy, who is the Programme Lead between the two in the Joint Business Council. So uh, you're very welcome to our committee. We take the opportunity to thank you. Um, obviously, uh, Brexit matters have been dominating a lot of the work of our committee over the past year and uh, we regularly engage with various sectors to get updates on what's happening and get a sense of what's taking place on the ground. So we really appreciate uh, yourselves coming together. I think the usual format is that we'll maybe fire it over to yourselves, maybe to say a few words or give us a bit of an introduction and then we can pass to members who will have specific questions and move to a question and answer session after that. So if you're happy enough, I'll pass over to yourselves then. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I'm going to do some introductory remarks and then um, Fergal and um, Michael will, will follow me. So by way of introduction, I am the, the Regional Director of the CBI in Northern Ireland. Uh, CBI, as you probably know, is the, the UK's leading business organisation. We speak for about 190,000 businesses across the UK and um Within that, you know, the employees represent about a third of the private sector. Um, so a full spectrum of business interests by sector and by size. And in Northern Ireland, we represent over 75% of the top 100 companies. 
So we very much welcome the opportunity today um, um, surrounding um, this particular issue and, and your willingness to engage on it. Um, I suppose as we approach around 90 days into the new arrangements, certainly CBI members report that trade has been moving reasonably well and that they are increasingly getting to grips with the new administrative requirements. Um, the CBI know that the, the protocol is not perfect, but it is a dynamic framework that the business community wants to bed down and to secure um, so that we can have peace and prosperity in the island. And we know that it is needed to uphold the, the trade and cooperation agreement for the whole of the UK as well. Um, the upshot of maintaining largely barrier-free trade across the island of Ireland has already delivered economic benefits. Um, with recent data shown in January that um, Republic of Ireland imports from Northern Ireland were up 10% and exports um, to Northern Ireland were up 17%. But ultimately, Britain is Northern Ireland's largest trading market and therefore getting that unfettered access to the market has been hugely important to us. Um, however, getting to grips with the at-risk test, the roads of origin, the customs administration has not all been plain sailing for Northern Ireland businesses. Um, the new arrangements are much better than a disorderly withdrawal from the EU, but we do need to urgently find solutions to the, I think, the well-documented challenges and barriers to trade from, from Britain. So in August last year um, at the CBI, we set up a, a weekly protocol working group, which um, is made up of about 20 senior executives from a range of um, different industries who trade with GB, between GB and Northern Ireland, between Northern Ireland and, New York, and Europe as well. And this working group has provided us with real-time insights from members um, and has been instrumental in the CBI understanding the operational challenges that firms face when trading under the protocol. Um, since January, it would be the CBI's view that trade has flowed relatively well for Northern Ireland firms from Northern Ireland to GB. But there have been problems, especially in January, with trade flowing from GB into Northern Ireland. Um, trade flows, I think, in quarter one must be caveated um, with reference to the wider trading environment, whereby companies have been exposed to global supply chain issues arising from, from COVID. Um, but particularly, the trade issues that have emerged for, for my members have been around timings, um, some delays initially, particularly with um, inbound loads, although most of it was getting through. Some There were, there were some issues with paperwork. Um, administration is obviously heavier now, um, particularly for product of animal origin. Um, the complexity around the at-risk test and how it interacts with the rules of origin requirements under the, the TCA SPS checks and certifications are an issue. Um, very complex administration there and a shortage of vets. You know, trade costs are obviously rising. Ease of doing business is, is not so smooth. Rebate scheme is definitely an issue for companies. Um, but notwithstanding all the challenges, I think the CBI has been consistent in supporting companies in terms of how they operate under the protocol. And we have supported the protocol against the alternative, which um, was a disorderly withdrawal from the EU. So we are committed to supporting um, policymakers and doing all that is required to ensure the protocol works for business in a manner that protects trade both east-west and north-south. Um, so I will finish there and pass to Fergal. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. Um, good afternoon, Chair and Committee members, and, and many thanks for the opportunity to meet with you today. Um, for what us is a really important and critical issues, I suppose, for, for business and the wider economy. Um, so I'm Fergal O'Brien, Director of Policy and Public Affairs at IBEC. And maybe just firstly, I'd just like to say a few words about IBEC. I know some of you may be familiar with us and maybe others less so. Um, so IBEC is Ireland's largest business representative group um, and we're the largest lobbying organization of, of any type in, in, in Ireland and also at an EU level we're actually the, the third largest national representative group. Uh, so we have about 250 staff now in IBEC working across the area of policy development that I lead out on, uh, on employer and HR and workplace issues. And we also then have 38 different trade associations. Um, IBEC is quite unique in, in, in that context and all of the various trade associations working across the different sectors of the economy, they're fully integrated into the one organization. 
So, for example, in IBEC, you'll find the retail sector, food and drink, uh, medical technology, biopharma technology, financial services, property, and a host of other industry groups all working side by side for the betterment of the economy and society all within the same organization. So that's been very useful, particularly in the in, in the context of, of Brexit and the challenges that that has brought. Um, our member engagement on Brexit has varied across the different sectors of the economy, I think, to be fair to say. Um, for some sectors, such as, as food and drink, and again, Angela mentioned the particular challenges that the, the food sector has been facing, um, it's by, by far been the most significant policy issue impacting on them over the last number of years. While for others in the services sector, it's probably been much less dominant. Um, but there's no question for all our members and for all businesses, there has been extensive engagement on all of the planning required to be as prepared as possible for what was a major change as we see it in the economic order which, which Brexit has brought about. Um, again, this was very much like Angela and the CBI experience. I would say that by and large, our members are working through the changes without severe disruptions, although most are now reporting a higher cost of doing business as a result of those new regulatory administrative changes, and in particular, the supply chain uh, alterations, which have been material. Um, the level of disruption now as we I suppose, come to the end of this quarter one, they're nowhere near as severe as they were in January, that's for sure. And many of those initial cheating problems have been overcome. However, we continue to hear from our members that the movement of goods on and off the island has become much more complex and, and crucially costly and many businesses fear that that is going to be a long-term increased cost in, term, in terms of doing business. Um, the export companies in, in IBEC memberships, membership are definitely relieved that the new GB border operating model requirements were due to come in in, in April and again in July ha, have been postponed with a further grace period um, because many had feared that, that further disruption to trade flows uh, would be brought about. Uh, we were quite concerned in terms of the capacity on issues such as um, animal health issues and, and, and associated checks. Um, IBEC has always supported a meaningful transition period in the Brexit process. And it has been a source of frustration for our members that business was ultimately left with so little time to plan and prepare for what were very significant changes. Um, to, to make some comments on how supply chains have been working uh, across the island of Ireland from our members' experience, those with integrated supply chains uh, are reporting that they continue to work effectively. But again, their business operations have not been without their challenges. Uh, a number of our members, particularly in, in food and related sectors, are reporting that the treatment of Northern Ireland origin inputs being a particular challenge in relation to external EU trade deals and other EU issues as well. So that definitely remains an ongoing challenge for our members and something we're very aware of engaging with our government on. Um, overall, I suppose to conclude, uh, it's very clear to us, look, that the Irish economy actually, despite the, the very significant twin challenges of Brexit and COVID, uh, it continues to grow and, and will grow, grew last year and will grow again in 2021. But that economic performance is very much what we call K-shaped. So we're seeing some sectors of our economy performing very strongly, strongly, while others unfortunately remain in shutdown right now. But overall, we are looking to the post-COVID world with confidence, given the underlying strength that we see in business and we see in our business business model. And in particular, we're urging po policymakers to be ambitious in investment for economic recovery. And we see particular opportunities to progress ambitious connectivity and investment programs that will benefit the entire island of Ireland. So I'll leave my opening remarks there for now, and I'll pass on to my colleague, Michael Darcy. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And I'd like to join Angela and Fergal in thanking you for the opportunity to address the committee this afternoon. I'm the program lead for the IBEC CBI Joint Business Council, or JBC for short. Personally, I've been involved in researching and considering North-South economic and business interaction since the early 1990s. In the context of your previous discussion, I'm not sure if that puts me in the younger or the older age cohort, but perhaps somewhere still in the middle. But certainly now that the UK has left the EU, this is a welcome and important conversation on the implications of for business of this new North-South dynamic that's resulted, and indeed implementing the Northern Ireland, Ireland Protocol. So a little background first on the JBC. It has been around for five decades and has in that time facilitated business leaders in both jurisdictions to jointly promote strategic investment to support the growth of business employment across the entire island. 
the focus of its work is to identify and promote opportunities for mutual benefit. And the key words there are mutual benefit. So CBI and IBEC members first met to discuss these opportunities along with their shared concerns in the early 1970s. Indeed, we have the minutes for that first meeting, and it might surprise you to know, or maybe not surprise you, that three top items were improving the transport infrastructure, secondly, dealing with the illegal movement of steel, which was distorting the market, and thirdly, the opportunities were going to be created by both the UK and the Republic being in the then EEC. In the five decades since, the JBC has constructively informed and supported the development of joined up north-south infrastructure. And this is important that it encompasses soft as well as hard elements that are needed by business, not just transport and spatial planning, but also skills and research and development, for example. So in the early 1990s, the JBC responded to the new opportunities created by the single excuse me, single European market by providing evidence, and this has always been critical to the JBC's approach, that following the paramilitary ceasefires and the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, there were north-south opportunities of mutual benefit, because at that stage there was a lot of doubt and concern that they weren't the case for doing more trade and business across this island's borders. Indeed, at that time, the trade and business across this island border was the lowest in the then EEC. Indeed, this opportunity was first envisaged by Sir George Quigley's seminal proposal for an island economy, and indeed the Belfast, Belfast Dublin Economic Corridor that coincidentally was rebooted this morning, jointly by Belfast City Council and Dublin City Council, along with all of the local authorities along the East Coast. And I think that's a very interesting new revival of a long-standing idea that has a lot further to go. More recently, the JBC has produced a number of original reports, such as Business on a Connected Island, showing conclusively that Ireland and Northern Ireland have benefited economically since from peace, stability and an invisible border for goods, services, labour and finance. Our annual Business on a Shared Island conference has presented case studies from a wide range of companies on the all-island economy's operational benefits for their business. And that's always been the focus, the practical and functional dimensions where they work for business. In addition, our rather visionary connected report in the mid in the middle of the last decade proposed the completion of the island's core transport network to match the needs of a prosperous population of 10 million people in the coming decade. Of course, Brexit has brought about changes that are having universal impact across business and society. During 2020, COVID has added to that and accelerated disruptive trends, but greater opportunities are now also prevented, presented, such as climate change actions. And indeed, yesterday, you're probably aware the government of the Republic announced their considerably more ambitious and determined plans in the climate action area. However, the experience of all island business is that tackling these challenges will benefit from the shared prioritization, development and delivery of a more ambitious long-term strategic shared island investment program. So, having consulted with both CBI and IBEC members on this new environment for business, the JBC has identified the following immediate north-south opportunities for that shared investment program. The first would be share, supporting existing business operations that operate on an all-island basis. Secondly, developing the all-island labour market and, of course, in the COVID environment, in terms of people remote working, etc., there are many more opportunities there. Thirdly, investing in skills, education and innovation essential for the recovery of both economies. And fourthly, ramping up physical infrastructure investment. There's a number of projects to be completed, but there are new projects to be identified and pursued. In addition, finally, a more dynamic approach is urgently required on a number of strategic cross-cutting policy decisions and actions that are core to successfully leveraging these opportunities. Obviously, and most of all, the shared climate change goals, that's a number one priority for every government in every jurisdiction and across every sector. Second, stronger institutional engagement. In that context, we welcome the, engage, the revival of the North South Ministerial Council and the beginning of it working, beginning again. And we'd like to see that on an east-west basis in the context of British-Irish Council as well. And finally, more effective communication that comes across with more positive dimensions of how constructively business and the economy is contributing to the prosperity and peace of this island on both sides of the border. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that. Yeah, that's given us a real um, flavour for the work that you're doing and of course the challenges uh, undoubtedly that you're facing in the current 
time, maybe not just so different from that first meeting uh, 50 years ago, uh, maybe a bit different emphasis, but still similarly um, some problems that are faced. And I suppose maybe what's interesting is that organisations such as yourselves and, uh, um, and the JBC, it's about finding solutions to those problems is what's the most constructive thing uh, and the most helpful thing. Uh, and certainly I think it's incumbent upon uh, the governments uh, in in London, Dublin, and the executive here in Belfast to try and do what it can to try and help with those solutions and define those solutions, uh, albeit that may even just be about identifying the problems, but certainly once you've identified them, you can certainly try to overcome them. Um, in terms of maybe asking a few questions, um, I was wondering maybe if I could get a sense from, from yourselves, uh, and you had referenced this around the transition period. I mean, it felt like the transition period wasn't a transition period. It was a space in which they tried to find out what the new uh, circumstances were going to be like. And then all of a sudden, they were brought in from the 1st of January, actually in the transition period now. Um, and I think that there is um, some sound that certainly going from trade that goes from, from uh, Northern Ireland over to GB is kind of happening and getting up to a reasonable level. Um, but maybe it's the trade that's coming from GB over to NI where there are problems. And I suppose if I could, by extension, ask if you're experiencing that the, the Dublin to GB route working okay or not, and whether there's difficulties coming back the way, because I think we need to keep reminding certainly the, the London government that they need to work with businesses in GB to make sure that they are at the level uh, to be able to interact with the protocol, to be able to get items over uh, to Northern Ireland, but also over to Dublin. So uh, have you any thoughts or views or, or sort of experiences from the ground in the first few months based on that? Angela, will I let you go first? And then I yeah, yeah, I was going to tell, I'll, I'll maybe go first and then let you, Fergal, come in on the on the um, British-Irish ROI trade, if that would yeah. work. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing now is things, you know, relatively smoothed out. Um, we don't have issues going Northern Ireland to GB, but we do have some issues, as I say, you know, I mentioned them. Um, there's there's difficulties with GB to Northern Ireland. That said, we have had, you know, communications on this. We've had, you know, meetings um, with the UK government and there has been a piece of work done and they're still working on this in the background for companies in GB to understand the administration, the documentation that they need to fill out to trade with Northern Ireland. Now, um, since January, that has improved and a number of more, you know, more and more companies are, are coming online. That says, you know, that said, there's still things that have to be done. And I think probably the UK government in terms of, um, you know, simplifying and clarifying the guidance around rules of origin, um, expediting the, the rebate scheme that companies would like to use, that will all help. Um, the trader support scheme has really been very useful. We've got very good feedback from members, but we would like to see a bit of um, um, more simplicity around data entry on that, I think, you know, members talk about. So we know that there's more could be done and, you know, this is going to take time, um, but we do need a, a sort of that collaborative approach from the government to work with business and to work with the um, to the EU side to, to make it happen in a much more smooth fashion. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Angela. Um, it definitely landed on us at the, at the last minute in the, in the days before Christmas. I think I'd been hoping for a sleep in on Christmas Eve <laughs> and that didn't happen. And that was the same for, for businesses, um, you know, despite the fact that you know, many of the new arrangements may have been signposted in advance until we ultimately had an agreement and we had that certainty that tariffs were not going to be part of our trade and cooperation agreement. Businesses weren't really able to, to fully plan. Um, and we were frustrated absolutely from, from an Irish business perspective that we ended up in a situation that we didn't have a meaningful um, transition period. 
I think that made it very difficult for businesses to be fully prepared despite all of the engagement we had with them and the work that that state agencies um a, again in 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 the United, in the in the UK and here in Ireland had done you know it, it lots of businesses still were not where they should have been um but we 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 can't look beyond the last minute nature I think of of the agreement and the disruption that that caused so January was was difficult um when we look now I suppose at the flows between GB and Dublin and Ireland more widely, um, we see that a lot of companies have changed their supply chains. Um, we've seen the, the trade data initially for January and February, which is substantially down uh, on, on what would, it would have been a year earlier. Um, I think we can't underestimate the complexity as to how the supply chain logistics system works in terms of companies using the land bridge from the continent through GB, working with other suppliers, picking up occasional pallets, bringing them for SMEs across the economy, all of that has been disrupted. And unfortunately, again, you know, we need to see this level out a little bit as we've gone through some of those teething problems. Um, but it looks like to us that that will result in a kind of a permanent uh, supply chain disruption between GB and the Republic. I think that's unfortunate. We really want to see that strong cooperation, both north, south and east and west, to support all of our economies. Um, but we're seeing our members now struggling with those disruptions and facing higher costs. And they've lost so much of the agility in their supply chain because being able to hop across the Irish Sea in a very kind of timely and efficient way was really good for business. Trying to manage supply chains now where we have an uncertain land bridge or working directly with the continent has been very disruptive. So some of the teething problems have been overcome, but we do see significant long-term costs, higher costs of doing business and ultimately disrupted supply chains, which we think are bad for both the Irish and the wider UK, GB and NI economies. I was just maybe going to add as well, Chair, I mean, I would agree with Fergal. It was a very abrupt start to the year. Um, you know, the 11th hour deal didn't help, you know, and I mean, larger firms certainly were wise to what they had to do. Um, but, you know, still had to employ a lot of teams to come in over Christmas to try and be ready. Many of them had bought things in advance to reduce the, you know, the the, um, the issues around delays, etc. Um, but the grace periods have, have helped and obviously, um I suppose what we need now mostly is for the UK and the EU to agree those grace periods um, and use the time wisely when we get them to find long-term solutions. Okay. Um, and in terms of obviously, you know, it's a comp complex problem uh, and complex set of logistics that need to be worked around, but well, there won't be any silver bullets to it. I have heard some sectors such as retail and I, for example, saying that if some sort of agreement could be found on the SPSS checks, that that would remove such a substantial amount of the paperwork and such a substantial amount of the um, the the sort of issues and problems that it would allow trade to flow a lot easier after. Is that something that you could see being useful and something that we maybe should be sort of trying to pursue and ask for? Yeah, I mean, certainly from the from the Northern Ireland perspective, you know, we're a very agri-food based um, economy and the, the, this has been a significant burden. Um, so I think probably it has caused a lot of the delays. There's been problems around the number of vets, etc. And maybe a, a UK EU veterinary agreement would be the solution. Okay. And Fergal, how would that impact on, 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 in Dublin? Again, our members are, are are struggling with a lot of these same issues. Uh, in particular, I suppose, when we were looking, as I said, at the new requirements coming into place for selling into GB from the first of April, they were very concerned. Um, so I agree with Angela that we need to use this time ahead now to be to be much better prepared in terms of supporting seamless trade. Um, obviously. We, we we will have our commitments in terms of single and internal markets um, that our industry, they, they're very significant requirements upon them and they need to comply with them. Um, but we, we want to see that cooperation really being enhanced between, between the UK and the EU because some, some of the challenges we've had in the early part of this year has been very disruptive. Okay. Look, I'm going to open up to, to members for questions and move to Martina for some questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for the information and for the presentation. And 
Um, as, as, as I was listening to you, uh, particularly when you were talking about the difficulties that you're having with goods and produce coming from Britain um, over to the north and indeed um, across the island, uh, it's not only Britain to the north or to the island that you would know that there are difficulties. Um, there are problems with moving, especially agri-food, goods from Britain to the EU, to Portugal, to Germany, to Croatia. Uh, and across the island. So um, there's no protocol, as we know, in the English Channel. And so the pro the problems are clearly Brexit itself. I don't know if you picked up there were there was a traitor who campaigned for Brexit, voted for the leave, and to his horror, I think today, has discovered that there's, and this is from somebody in Britain, that there's uh, a 38 pages of paperwork when he's tried to export to France from England was costing over five hundred pound uh, per shipment, um, and and as I say, that's someone who didn't realise the import of uh, of the consequences of of Brexit, which has been an unmitigated disaster. So, can I ask you? You, you touched on it there, Angela, in relation to the grace period, and whatever about if there's any further agreements made between the British government and the EU, you know that we all know the EU has clearly called it out that the British government has breached an international agreement. So what kind of preparation is going on at the moment by businesses to prepare for what was agreed in December? And you know, I would, I mean, I would prefer we didn't and we, we hadn't been dragged out of the EU. But given that we have been and there are consequences of Brexit, are businesses preparing for a end of a grace period? Or are they sitting back waiting in the hope that maybe the EU and the British government may come to some kind of um, another agreement? But given what we know about the EU has already said the British government has breached an international agreement. I mean, I think we come at this from the perspective that you know solutions can be found to the to the um, barriers that we see at the moment. We think that you know there is you know possibility to get agreements and all these issues. But what we really need is for the UK government and the EU to get into a room to sit down and to work out the solutions. Um, so I mean that is the, I think they they can be found if the political will is there. Um, but there's no doubt about it. You know, there's there's quite a few hiccups. This is by far from, you know, um, an easy journey. And and I think the the cooperation between the UK and the EU will be needed to get there. For us, as I say, it's about extending those grace periods, and then to and I think this is what business expect. Then the UK government and the EU to use the time during the grace periods to come out with long lasting solutions, which will will work into the to the longer term. Um, my concern with that, uh, and like I would, I would like that to be an outcome that, um, and I, I, I would share your your view that if, if there had been an agreed grace period, in fact, we had asked for the transition period to be extended, uh, and that's exactly what the grace period was about, uh, and that was rejected by the British government too. But given that present businesses say that uncertainty is bad. And the British government is acting unilaterally. So whatever about the British government and the EU going into the room, they were in a room, they made an agreement, a withdrawal agreement, and then to prevent a disorderly withdrawal from the EU, uh, we had the cooperation uh, agreement that was made. So and given that business uh, is very clear, always saying to us about the difficulties um, if they're operating, within that uncertain climate, then what is the what are businesses doing, uh, I mean, in terms of engaging with both the British government and the EU as well? Like, I know it's been a very difficult period for you, but I know the EU certainly listened to businesses yeah. as, they, as they did you know, throughout the period of the withdrawal agreement. So this is even in relation to you all. And maybe if I could ask, Michael, you, you touched on the um the area of services as we know services aren't included in the withdrawal agreement so um have there been any uh, difficulties emerging 
uh, from that? Or is it too early at this stage? Or is there something that you envisage that can happen um, as a consequence of the north of services not being in the that, that withdrawal agreement? Maybe um, Martina, I'll come in first on what you know. What are businesses doing, and who are they talking to? And I mean, I, I can say that um, you know we're having very good engagement actually with with the government on this. We have fortnightly meetings with HMRC. We um, meet regularly with the Trader Support Scheme. They have come to our working group, um, I think, t twice already. Um, and they're always available when we want to catch up with them on issues. We are having monthly meetings with the, the Welsh Government around the Dublin to Holyhead route. We meet with the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland. And we met with Simon Coveney, I think it was, back in February. Um, we are part of the, the Business Brexit Task Force, um, so we bring up, and there's a particular Northern Ireland um, dimension to that, and we work with the Northern Ireland office on a regular basis, feeding in what the issues are and what um, business see as being the solutions as well. Um, in terms of, Martina, thank you for your question. Um, but first, can I just say something again, as you saw, the JPC likes to take the longer time strategic view. I think one of the things that's been because of the difficulties that are being encountered in the short term with the trade movements, and I think there are practical solutions to that, the wider dimension of the protocol, unfortunately, has, has still not been really looked at. I mean, there's a lot more in it, even though the movement of goods part is the important part. There's a lot more in it than that, as, as, as you all appreciate. There's the whole question of the common travel area which clearly has been very important to keep that and to retain that in terms of the food meat movement of people on the island. And that's relevant to your question about services because it's people who deliver services rather than goods. So having the travel comp common travel area there underpins the continuation of an all island labor market, whether that be in the, you know, the geographic Northwest or whether it be in the Dublin Belfast corridor or wherever. So that's a very important piece. Also, there's the question of article 11, which, maintains the conditions for continued north-south cooperation. And there's a whole list of areas there that came out of the um, the mapping exercise that was done by the EU and the UK to, that identified over 160 areas or 140. Seems to be disagreement about that like so much else. But again, in there, it's interesting you should mention, we still have key elements of the, the, uh, the infrastructure that supports north South in terms of the electricity market that's still in place and that's a service, that's important. There's a whole question of climate change, the whole question of environment, that's covered there as well as the question of skills. All of these areas, I think, are perhaps, you know, what you're asking a question, which we don't know the answer to really, has Fergal identified that this moment in time, given that regulation continues to be aligned north and south, there is relatively little disruption that we have evidence to, to the provision of services. So it's a question over time, the degree to which that, 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 that alignment continues in place in order to support the continuation of this action and the cooperation and the businesses that are, you know, underpinning and doing North-South business. Michael, can I, can I ask you just in relation to Fort Fergal, maybe comes in, with regards to the All-Ireland supply chain, um, because you can see it has been strengthened uh, north to south, south to north, and given that we can see that beef is down like ninety five percent from Britain going into to Europe, you know salmon is down ninety two percent, pork you know eighty six uh, percent, and so on and so on it goes, and it is just you know quite significant that the overall export from Britain into Europe is down nearly fifty percent. So the, um, when you talk about the work that's going on in the 156 areas, as you say, closer to 160 areas of all Ireland cooperation and alignment, can you see the, the alignment strengthening? Like you mentioned the economy. I think I don't know whether it was Angela Fergal, maybe it was Fergal mentioned the economy and the, um, the way people now are looking elsewhere for a supply chain because businesses will always find, I think, a solution to this. And, uh, and I can see the all Ireland supply chain uh, being one of those solutions that, that businesses will look further to. So before I give it to Fergal, because he has the hands-on information through the dairy and the beef sector, et cetera, his actual numbers, et cetera. Again, I perhaps just like to broaden the debate initially and just highlight that, in fact, the biggest winners in the, uh, you know, the North-South cooperation, the all Ireland economy are actually SMEs. 
and Intertrade Ireland has identified 7,000 SMEs that operate on a, on a cross-border basis, many of those as sub-suppliers to larger businesses. So I think, again, it's important not to lose sight of their concerns and their needs, et cetera. And I mean, that's very much something local authorities can look at, as well as the executive and the agencies at the local development agent, enterprise agencies. And that's important not to be lost sight of as well. I think we are optimistic about the opportunities because for two reasons. One, it's essential with COVID recovery, the economy is under pressure. It needs all of the elements of potential support for employment and to return to whatever the new normality is to be working as effectively as possible. So I don't think not being ambitious and opportune and is an option, frankly, whether in whatever context, to be honest. And second of all, as you say, business does have a capacity to find its way around difficulties and fundamentally economics should ultimately, we hope, win out. And the All Island economy is premised on the economies of scale and proximity. It is an island. We are close to each other. And that makes it easy, especially for SMEs, to work closely and then to underpin the larger uh, larger operations of large businesses. I mean, if, if I may, just for a minute, because there's not enough practical examples in my mind. If we want tourism to recover, obviously, for just take a practical example, if I'm running a business to attract wealthy Americans to play golf on the island, I want to be able to access all of the major golf courses on the island, not just one. Or if I'm producing milk, why do I want to sell to Bailey's Irish Cream? Because if they're selling more, you know, more product in the international marketplace, I have another option for my product. You know, likewise, there's, there's lots of practical examples like that that are not getting a fish efficient highlight at the moment. And I'd like to see, let's get beyond the difficulties and also look at these more immediate and practical benefits. I think, Michael, just what you're saying there, the lion's share of our economy here in the north um, is made up of SMEs. And the majority of people who work here in the north work in SMEs. And the 80, over 80% of them operate on an all ireland basis. So I think you're right. There has been, there has been focus and attention uh, given to, obviously, difficulties need attention, of course. But the, the sterling work that's going on uh, SMEs and others operating on an all Ireland uh, basis, of course, uh, as an Irish Republican. And uh, that's why I would like to see this country reunited. But that's another conversation for another day. I was just going to say as well, Martina, before we go to Fergal, that um, I think it is important to remember that the, the supply chains across the island are highly dependent on the supply chains, very deeply integrated with GB as well and with Europe. Um, and when the when those get interrupted, it doesn't do anyone any favor. So it's trying to get the trade flow and without as much, you know, without disruption as much as possible yeah. is their ultimate goal for us between the islands and between Europe. Yeah, and of course, Angela, and we all said there were going to be consequences of Brexit. You know, unfortunately, uh, it was an unmitigated disaster. And but let's hopefully we can get some of the wrinkles ironed out. Then maybe Fergal. Yeah, thanks very much, Martina. There's just so much disruption at the moment. And I think one of the things that we probably underestimate is the collision factor between COVID and Brexit. And sometimes it's it's hard to disentangle what was COVID and what was Brexit. And, and they have come together with, with significant impact. I, I think, as Michael says, beyond this, I do see a lot of opportunity. One of the things we've noticed, I suppose, in terms of feedback, from our members in recent weeks um, and months as they reflected on this. And it's interesting to go back probably about 15 years ago in the, particularly the consumer market uh, in the Republic, it was very much a kind of a, a standalone kind of supply chain framework. And then when the, the last crisis hit, that very much shifted to a, a just-in-time model out of a GB-based warehouse type structure for, for an awful lot of the entities and consumer businesses. And I think for various reasons, that's been re-looked at. So there's an awful lot of flux at the moment. As Angela said, it's really important that those east-west supply chains are working for us because otherwise the cost of doing business is, is just going through the roof and, and that's a real fear that we have but i think in that flux there is going to be opportunity for smes in northern ireland to supply more customers uh, in the republic i think that's definitely an, an opportunity that will emerge and we are continuing to see some of the, the realignment of that kind of supply chain structure so how major global corporates are supplying the Irish consumer market is changing. 
Um, and I think, unfortunately, we may move away from some of that model that was very much just in time from GB. But the things I suppose we'd really want to see happen, and look, that's a consumer distribution model. Of course, there's jobs, of course, there's economic activity in it. So that's what we really want to see is that additive opportunity um, around our all island economy in terms of skills sharing, in terms of innovation sharing, in terms of supply chains, in terms of businesses working with each other and competing globally. And Michael mentioned some of the opportunities in which as an island we can compete and win globally. Um, I think that and it's interesting to watch the developments in the UK in relation to corporate tax increases. We're going to see this, the same right across the world tax is going to become much less of a competitive issue and the things that will really matter in terms of helping us win as cooperating economies and and, and as cooperating business communities are going to be investment in our infrastructure our talent our skills and our innovation and i think on both sides of the island i think we are struggling on some of those right now we really want to see this ambitious nature of kind of investment coming through because there's so much opportunity there Okay, thank you uh, for those very really interesting answers and, and, and getting a flavour of, of what what's the opportunities are as well as what the problems are. Um, can I open up to any other members? I've not indicated with the raised hands uh, feature for speaking, but it's not always available to everybody. Are there any other members that would wish to ask a question? Okay, that's Grant. Thank you very much indeed for that. But look, I think we um, somewhat... I can see how we kind of straight toward what the economy committee should probably be investigating and discussing with you but it really does underpin some of the work that we've been doing uh from the scrutinizing perspective uh with the executive office and and to say i think there are a lot more interesting conversations to come in the future as to how we can uh, join together um i'm seeing emma there i know she's having really bad broadband problems but maybe she may be looking at question there emma do you want to try with that nightmare chair sorry can you hear me Yes, indeed, yes. Brilliant, thank you. Look, I, I want to thank um, Angela and Fergal and Michael for the, for the presentation. I had a question around, we know obviously the, the upshots of Brexit haven't really uh, presented themselves in totality yet because of, and you have touched on it in your presentation there, around the fact that this has coincided with COVID and it's hard, to, uh, in terms of the difficulties, it's hard to identify what's been caused by COVID, what's been caused by Brexit, what are the implications of the protocol and untangling all of that is difficult. I'm also conscious that there are things that are potentially being put on the long finger at the minute because of COVID and restrictions and the fact that people aren't moving about as much. But I had a query around businesses and what the feedback has been from employers around employees' rights and things that are being impacted by a removal from the EU. So I'm thinking of uh, difficulties that have yet to be ironed out and maybe haven't even presented themselves in, in totality yet around the frontier scheme and the, the EU settlement scheme. So, you know, anybody that's here working as, from, a, from another country, if they're crossing the border, what the, what the feedback has been from that and if employers are raising that as an issue. I know that I've spoken to employers in my own constituency who have employees from other European countries and they're not sure whether or not to raise it with them or to be advised employees, obviously, if, if they need to be um, filling an application, the fact that that closes in the summertime. So I just wanted to know if there was any feedback around that. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could say a few words on that, Chair, if it's okay. Um, certainly, um, there have been a few inquiries. There haven't been a lot um, from companies who have concerns how they will move people within teams across the island. So, you know, many of the big consultancy houses, big accountancy companies, law firms, they have um, all island businesses and they will move teams around. Now, many of the teams... And will have EU citizens in it, and there have been some queries around how they um, move them across the island if they're EU citizens, um, and, and you know the, just what's involved in that. Um, there's been increased difficulty, of course, since Brexit, not just for companies in Northern Ireland, but of course around you know um, the visa process and the extra administration and cost of, of attracting international workers. Um, one of the things that is raised also is the mutual recognition of professional qualifications. And um, before we, you know, the UK and the Irish government each acknowledged the 
professional qualifications as a, an essential facilitator to the right um, to work in both jurisdictions. However, they, um, the trade and cooperation agreement doesn't support the continuation of that um, between the EU and the UK. And so, you know, therefore, it's now, you know, the pathway is a regulator to regulator one um, in terms of the recognition and quite similar to what they'd thought about for Japan and Canada, but for neither of those have actually produced a mutual recognition agreement to date. So um, I think, you know, certainly would be very keen to say, see the UK and the Irish governments working hard to encourage um, those um, arrangements. But probably what is best is the, the support to develop an overarching sort of reciprocal framework, which is agreed between the UK and Ireland that allows for professional qualifications to be recognised. And, you know, this would benefit so many professions. Um, and give them a, a clear and consistent route to recognition across the, the common travel area. And Chair, I might make just a very brief comment on, on that issue, the, the frontier workers, um, which is, is definitely coming up more with some of our members. And there are issues that we're working with our government on to, to address that because we have issues around taxation and, and, and other aspects of that. So that's definitely become more of a challenge. And again, as um, as I was saying, the disentangling kind of Brexit, COVID, future of work. I, I, I think we're going to see a very kind of different business model operating in terms of where employees live and where they work. Um, so it's going to bring opportunities. It's definitely going to bring some some good employment opportunities in different parts of the island. But we, we need to make sure that, that those kind of frameworks are supporting it because right now there's some challenges. Yeah, and that's something we're very conscious of. Okay, you happy enough, Emma? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. Okay, perfect. That's grand. Okay. Listen, um, Michael Fergal, and thank you very much indeed. Um, busy enough year with Brexit and COVID for you, but we certainly appreciate your work and appreciate your contributions to the committee today. So thank you very much indeed. Oh. And hopefully we'll encounter oh. again. Every time I ask people if they want to ask questions, and then when I go to end, they cut in, but yes, come on ahead. I think that's Sorry, great. Mr. Chairman, there was just um, there were several comments yes. from you that I just think it's important to respond to rather than directly asking a question. Okay, come on ahead. Incredible, incredible that any member of the Northern Ireland Assembly would continue to defend a situation where 20%, the Chief Veterinary Officer has told us, 20% of the entirety of SPS checks that are conducted by the European Union are being carried out between GB and NI. I think that is totally disproportionate. And I don't think any person could possibly defend that. And the answer to uncertainty around these issues is not to make sure and certain that people's lives will continue to be difficult. So I just want to place that on record and um, I also, uh, just again, placed on record uh, my total opposition to the protocol and the, the need for it to be replaced. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, Christopher. Uh, anything else, members? Then I'm definitely going to guess for coming along. And I'm going to conclude there. So thank you very much indeed. And we'll give our guests a moment or two to to exit there and we'll get ready to move on to the next part of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think it's back to just ourselves. Wow. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So we can move on then to item eight, which is the forward work program, uh, which is on page 183 for members. Um, there are a few things that we need to do um, I, I, because the forward work program has kind of thinned out a little bit because we're coming to the end of our uh, the end of the term and going into recess. So what I'm going to suggest is that the um, clerk brings back uh, the forward work program and populates it with the sort of things that we need to be doing, like examining um, the you know checking out the financial elements and slotting in where we would have the junior ministers and the first and deputy first minister in for their. Uh, contributions and then whenever we come back and have our planning day it will allow us to have the spaces that we can then fill up with some of the things that committee members would like um, to do uh, and certainly that will involve us getting uh, met, uh, officials up in May to give us a briefing on the June monitoring round so would members be happy enough with that approach? 
Great. Okay, thank you. Um, there we go. Well, our members happy enough to note the forward work plan as it is there. Yep. Okay. Uh, in terms of correspondence, there's 11 items there and a number of items in the table uh, pack. Um, one, uh, which is item 9.4 uh, on page 221, is a proposed statutory rule on travel agents' financial assistance. Now, the SR will be subject to a negative resolution procedure, and it was laid on the 18th of March and came into operation on the 19th of March. We are required to get some detail in that and just do that usual of reading it into the record, but that will have to be done in our first meeting when we come back, um, whenever we get the detail, but we don't have it from the department yet, so uh, we'll need to get that just to, to keep members updated. And also, there is correspondence as well from the Welsh uh, Senate External Affairs and Additional Legislation Committee about some food safety and hygiene work we really probably, that's not our um, jurisdiction, but we may need to pass it on either to health or DARA, just to whichever committee it goes to, but just to get per permission to pass that on to the relevant committee. Okay, thank you. And is there any other items in correspondence that anybody, yeah, Martina, go on ahead. Chair, I, I also sit on the infrastructure committee and much to my disappointment, a few weeks ago, uh, we were told that the transfer of functions order, um, as you may recall, came to this committee on the reservoir issue. And we says, no, let it go out because it happened as a consequence of a mistake that reservoirs ended up in the Department for Agriculture as opposed to the Department for Infrastructure where the staff was. So there needed to be a transfer of functions order. We were told that that transfer of function order has still not been signed off yet. Um, I have made part, uh, queries about it and I've been told it's only about a process. So that's what this letter is about, uh, asking us as a committee to support the acceleration of that and to ask the Executive Office to please sign the transfer function order in relation to reservoirs. We have a reservoir in Craigan, in Derry. There's a number of reservoirs and we need this transfer function order so that it goes into the Department of Infrastructure who wants it. The committee, uh, the, uh, the minister will accept it. Uh, it is about a process, but it hasn't been done yet, and we need to get it moved forward. The chair has frozen. Okay, Michael, you're the clerk. <laughs> you might have this uh, we, 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 we don't have a deputy chair either. Uh, so, in in this occasion, if um, a member would like to nominate someone to take the chair temporarily while uh, Colin isn't in the room, uh, and if other members are happy that that person takes the chair, uh, then, we, <laughs> then we can carry on. Does anybody like to nominate? I nominate Pat. You nominate who? Oh, Pat. Okay. Everyone happy with Pat? Of All course. Right. Yeah. Okay, right, Pat, if you'd like to... Ah, Colin's back. That's good. <laughs> uh, Hello, Emma jinxed my uh, internet connection, I think, so she did. I was just about to say, I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, I, I thought the, it uh, just got kicked out completely of the meeting altogether, so... Um, sorry, did somebody take over there and progress, or...? Uh, yeah, I had just nearly deposed you when you returned. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a good move. It would have been well, well received. But Martina, I left. It was yourself was saying about the infrastructure committee. Yeah, there was infrastructure. Look, the infrastructure minister needs a transfer function order signed uh, by the TEO so that it can be moved out of the Department of Agriculture into the Department of Infrastructure. We need it moved in Derry. And we're asking if this uh, this would committee, please, will get on to TEO. It's only process. Uh, we've been talking to our people. There's no there's no hold up, uh, no ministerial you know hold up or anything else. But the officials need to get it signed and moved on. Okay. Well, members happy enough that we write to the executive office on that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Uh, any other items of correspondence? And then that moves me to any other business. Um, is there? Any other business? Why did Michael have something? Was I to raise something under any other business? No, <laughs> that doesn't. No, then it wasn't. Then it was something that I had in my head. Then that's fine. Um, then 
Uh, the date, time, and place of the next meeting will be Wednesday, the 14th of April uh, at 2 o'clock. So that's uh, us out for this term. Can I wish everybody a very happy Easter and hope that everybody gets a break for I don't think we've had much of a break over the last period of time. So if we get a chance to enjoy it and look forward to seeing everybody next term. Okay, take Maybe care. You care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 30.